Good evening and welcome to the June 8th, 2017 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. Uh, I will begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Molly Burnham. Ms. Rebecca Bizanski. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Present. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Mr. Present. Mr. Edward Present. 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 Excellent. So um, this evening we'll uh, we'll move from our regular order to begin the meeting with a special uh, recognition ceremony for our retirees. And the superintendent and I will now move to the podium. Welcome guests for what is probably after graduation the most bittersweet evening of the year, our retiree recognition. But if you hang in there with me, I will try to focus on the suite and we'll get through this. But if we could just start with a round of applause for our retirees. <laughs> I want to tell you about a dream I had this morning. This is an honest to goodness, true story. I dreamed I was in a room addressing a large group of people. It wasn't a nightmare, you know, superintendents expect that to happen. It's part of the job. So I was talking to these people and I was saying, Barbara Black is the Derek Jeter of early childhood directors. <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, I must truly believe, because I, I had actually put that in a written communication once, but you know, if you're dreaming about it, it's deep down inside of you. Um, you know, and the reason I say that is not because she's one of the retirees we're recognizing tonight, but because I could say that about so many other people who we're gonna recognize tonight. Um, you know, we could easily call Julie Clark the Derek Jeter of Leeds. Now, some of you might think Sal Canada would not approve, right? <laughs> Well, I know for a fact that he has a Derek Jeter jersey and he wore it. He lost a bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, we could say similar things about Allison Gleason or Sharon Matrician, but I, I hesitate to because Sarah is not as forgiving as Sal and she's extremely rigid about the Red Sox thing. Um, I keep. I keep uh, pointing it out to her as an area for improvement, but I guess there's some things that you'll just never be able to change. But anyways, um, I, I could say the same thing for all of you who are here tonight. So I really want to just say that we're saying goodbye to a class of GTarian caliber employees, and you all are really going to be missed. Um, so thank you for your service. Good luck at the next stage. And I want to let you know that you are the first class who will be honored by our special parting gift of this silver tray, which is a... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I have to tell you, one of the things we do when there's, when there's downtime in central office is we debate what gift should we give the retirees this year. <laughs> I have to tell you, that was a somewhat controversial choice. It was my choice, so I appreciate that, <laughs> that reaction. So um, we are going to call, as we always do, our retirees up. And this is intended to be in the order of years of service, although um, several employees contacted me during the social part of this saying that their listed years of service were not correct, so we will now be out of order. I'm going to go with whatever you told me your years of service were, <laughs> although I have to say this is not meant to be evidentiary for MTRS or Northampton <laughs> Retirement or anything like that. Um, so starting, um, and not, not all the people are here, so I'll just um, quickly mention those who are not here. So not here, we have Maura Stampa, a special education teacher at Jackson Street with two years. Angela Rota, the Director of Innovative Tech, Instruction and Technology, retiring after four years. Lori Farkas, Director of Student Services, retiring after five years. And then the first one who's here, Linda Pickering, Family and Consumer Science teacher at Northampton High School, retiring after seven years with the district. Thank you. 
Mary Savary's Technology Integration Specialist Bridge Street and Jackson Street is retiring after seven years with the district. That's right, you know it. Santa Park, special education teacher at Ryan Road Elementary, retiring after eight years. Lisa Browers, Title I Reading and Math teacher at JFK, retiring after 10 years. Now we have a few more who are not here tonight. Evelyn Sparko, World Language teacher at JFK, is retiring after 10 years with the district. And Gail Terranova, Northampton High School librarian, retiring after 10 years with the district. So moving on to Jody Kinner, uh, physical therapy assistant, retiring after 15 years. <laughs> Patricia Toswell, special education support professional at Ryan Road Elementary, retiring after 15 years in the district. <laughs> Allison Gleason. Education support professional at Ryan Road, retiring after, according to her, 27 years. <laughs> now we have a few more who are not here. Louise Homestead, a preschool teacher at Leeds Elementary School, retiring after 18 years with the district. Julie Kuros, Guidance Department Secretary at Northampton High, retiring after 18 years with the district. Janet Korzanowski, Kindergarten Teacher at Bridge Street, retiring after 20 years with the district. Beverly Shaw, Education Support Professional at Bridge Street School, retiring with 24 years in the district. Darlene Volpe, Custodian at Northampton High School, retiring after 25 years with the district. Now the last three, all of whom are here. Yeah. Big numbers. Sharon Matrician, Administrative Assistant at Ryan Road Elementary, retiring with 29 years of the <laughs> Julie Clark, Administrative Assistant at Leeds Elementary School, retiring with 30 years. And Andrea James, French teacher at JFK Middle School, retiring after 36 years with the <laughs> Thank you all for your service and best of luck. Thank you all again. So we now have um, the public comment period of the uh, meeting. Welcome, thank you all. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. Um, oh, actually, I do have a sign-up sheet, so, um, yep, perfect. So if you could just state your name um, and a, an address uh, for the record, and um, I would just ask you to uh, try to keep your remarks within three minutes. I've timed it. I think it's, it'll be pretty close. Perfect. You know, okay. okay. <laughs> um, my name is Sigrid Schmaltzer. I'm at 102 Williams Street in Northampton. And um, I have a child in Bridge Street School, um, very happily in Bridge Street School. Um, and I really appreciate this opportunity um, to share my thoughts. I want to speak um, just for a couple minutes on the question of police in schools. And I realize from um, uh, speaking with Ann Hennessy before the meeting that um, my information was um, incomplete coming in, but I think that also speaks to the need for, um, for more communication. Um, and that's really the main point I want to make, is that um, the goal of improved police and community 
community relations um, should start with community voices and community conversations. So when the High Five Fridays program was canceled, it seemed to me a thoughtful response to concerns raised by parents. Um, and then I was greatly taken aback to stumble on a solitary Gazette article that seemed to suggest that apparently without consulting these parents, um, the city was poised to simply replace that program with greater police presence um, in the schools. Um, so I would like to see the city begin with community forums to decide what kind of programming we want. Um, and I would suggest that holding such forums um, both provides um, the community with the right to participate in decision making and also provides city officials with the opportunity to hear voices of people who have a great deal to share. Um, so I want to use the rest of my time to offer you an example of the kind of testimony that you might hear at such a forum. And I think you'll um, agree with me that it would be very valuable to hear more of this. Um, this was written um, by a black woman with a child at uh, Northampton Public Elementary School. She would prefer to remain anonymous, um, but she, and she would also like to emphasize that she does not speak for all parents of color and recognizes that there's a diversity of perspective on this issue. So I'm now reading what she wrote. Uh, Before my son was six years old, he had already learned to fear the police. It was not something we taught him directly. We were friendly with people in uniform in our neighborhood, but the national news was kind of hard to ignore. He told me that, quote, I hope I never hear daddy's name on the radio because I will know he has been killed by the police. So basically, my child has never had the luxury of being naive about what could potentially happen to him in an interaction with law enforcement. He has already experienced fear for his own safety and those of his parents. We have nothing in our personal experience to counter his fear. My dad, who left a country where vigilante policing was sponsored by the government and people were jailed or killed for political reasons, tells me he has been stopped at least 30 times on US highways without being issued a ticket or being arrested, simply harassed. My husband lost his high school friend in an unjustified police shooting. My uncle, a retired corrections officer, got tired of being repeatedly stopped by fellow officers in upstate New York. He is one of several relatives who have left the country to be free of American racism. We should all be concerned about the mixed messages our children have to process and the contradiction they may one day see between the nice individual officers they met as kids and the institution of policing that is easily mobilized to keep people who have been out, uh, othered or criminalized out of their community. These others might be themselves or their good friends. If police officers are visiting schools, they should come ready to face unanswerable questions from my kid with his parents present. They should also hear from parents who feel they have to coach their kids on how to increase their chances of surviving police encounters. I'm not opposed to our school buildings being a venue for an important community dialogue. But so far, and I will note she was reading the same Gazette article I was, right? So far, it sounds like these programs are only designed to benefit the public image of the police and not to critically examine the nature of community police relationships or help us to construct something positive together. Um, so that I will leave it at that. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much. The next person who signed up is Julie Spencer Robinson. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Julie Spencer Robinson. I live at 248 Spring Grove Avenue and I'm president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Last month I told you about two labor management projects that Superintendent Provost and I are currently working on in the district and tonight I'd like to tell you about another collaboration. Dr. Provost and I are co-chairs of the Educator Evaluation Committee whose responsibilities are to review the evaluation processes and procedures and recommend adjustments to ensure alignment of educator and administrator goals with the district improvement plan and to review the aggregation of educator and administrator goals and make recommendations for professional development opportunities to the Joint PD Committee. This is not easy or particularly gratifying work as you might imagine but I believe it's critically important to ensure a constructive educator evaluation process that's implemented fairly and supports continuous professional growth. The biggest budgetary investment you make is in educators, and we have a singular impact on student achievement. I'd like to give you an example of how our shared leadership approach benefits students, families, teachers, and administrators of the Northampton Public Schools. 
At the May meeting of the Educator Evaluation Committee, we discussed DESE's newly expanded survey for students in the 5th, 8th, and 10th grades to complete at the end of MCAS. One teacher on the committee had been part of the tripod survey pilot last year, and she noted that there were similar questions on the DESE survey, but unlike with the tripod survey where aggregated student responses were only seen by the teacher, with the DESE survey, the results would be seen and shared by school and district personnel. Teachers also observed that some of the questions were evaluative in nature. As a local president, I had received a legal brief on the DESE survey from the MTA General Counsel, and I distributed that to all members of the committee. <coughs> issues that were identified had to do with the potential legal implications if students reported that they had been a victim of a criminal act, witness to a crime, at risk of future harm, or had their civil rights violated. There were also concerns about privacy because DESE would preserve the links between individual students and their survey responses, and the survey results would be a matter of public record. Finally, parents did not have to give consent for their students to take the survey. Dr. Provost decided to convene a video conference of the Educator Evaluation Committee to discuss these issues and arrive at a consensus recommendation. In the meantime, he queried other superintendents in the state to see whether or not their districts were administering the DESE survey, and I did the same with other large local presidents. After a lively and thoughtful discussion, our recommendation and his decision was that it not be given. We felt that this decision was in the best educational and professional interests of, the school, of our school community, and I share it with you tonight because I believe you will too. I'd like to publicly thank all of the educators who serve on this committee, Michelle Subox, Elizabeth Skelly, Michelle Mokrzecki, Greg Kerstetter, Heather Brown, Leslie Wilson, Lori Valencourt, Pam Plummer, Karen Jarvis Vance, and Sal Kanata. Thank you. Okay, um, there's no one else signed up for public comment. Is there anyone else who wishes to offer public comment? Hearing none, we'll move on in the agenda to announcements by members of the school committee. Are there any announcements? Ms. Fallon. Uh, so now I'm worried that Alina was gonna announce these same things, but um, the Northampton High School Teen Advocacy Group, were you going to? It was not. Okay, well. the Teen Advocacy Group um, <laughs> has an exhibit <coughs> <coughs> called New Americans. Uh, it's a photo voice exhibit that will share the immigration experiences of American immigrants, refugees, and citizens through um, interviews, portraits, and photography. Um, it op the opening is uh, the opening celebration is between five and seven this coming Monday um, at Forbes Library, um, and it would be wonderful um, if anyone could stop by um, and see what they've been up to, um, and also. Uh, this Friday night at Click Workspace between 5.30 and 7.30 um, is the NEF um, showcase of um, grant uh, winners and there will also be tours offered to the Bridge Street uh, Gardens um, and, um, and uh, there will be refreshments available. So I hope that people will stop by and see all the wonderful things that the Northampton Education Foundation has funded in our schools. Any other announcements? Okay. okay. The, that Click Workspace is on um, Market Street, I believe. Yes. Okay. So we'll um, now move into the reports and recommendations uh, portion of the agenda, and I'll turn it over to our student representative, Elena Fragamini. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just want to thank Ms. Fallon for bringing up those two things and add my pitch for everyone to attend the NEF showcase. We will have high school students there showing off the amazing things that NEF has done for us. I will be there. Um, so <laughs> if you guys want to stop by, it's a fantastic place to see um, the amazing programs <coughs> in our schools. Um, so moving on to more general news, um, the student union held their elections today. Um, so just to remind you guys, I'm a member of the student union. That's why I'm here. Um, the rising senior, junior, and sophomore classes voted to elect their four representatives to the student union. Um, rising freshmen will elect their representatives in September once they're at the high school and have been able to um, be taught kind of like what student government is, what student union is. Um, so in the next week or so, the student union will meet to vote on offices within the union, such as president, vice president, and school committee student representative. Um, so I'm unsure whether or not I will be reelected to be student 
representative to school committee. Um, so if this is my last meeting, which I hope it is not, um, <laughs> I want to extend my wholehearted gratitude to all of you for welcoming me to this committee and for being so responsive to the issues brought up by students in our community. This has truly been a fantastic experience and I look forward to seeing the issues you will tackle in the future with the student union. Um, so spring sports are coming to an end. There are a few teams that I need to congratulate. Um, the Northampton High School softball team advanced to Western Mass D1 semifinals and played Minichog at UMass Wednesday night. Um, they did not win, but I think it was their first time there in like 10 years or something, so congratulations to them. Um, and the Northampton boys track team, their four by 400 meter comprised of Nick Smith, Patrick Quinlan, Cola Valley, and Ethan Cooper, um, took first in the Massachusetts All-State competition. So huge congratulations to them. And a bunch of members of the team will be going to the New Balance Nationals next week in North Carolina. Um, pretty pretty exciting stuff. So these are just a few notable accomplishments, but we have many amazing teams and student athletes that have accomplished so much in the spring season. So congratulations to all of them. Um, seniors have now officially completed classes at Northampton High School. Um, so many teachers who teach um, classes with a lot of upperclassmen have smaller class sizes. And because of this, um, in a lot of classes, teachers are able to do more long-term in-depth projects in that last month of the school year with just juniors, um, sophomores, and freshmen. Um, so, for example, in my microeconomics class, we are taking an in-depth look into individual product markets in our own community. Um, in my European history course, we are using the skills of historical analysis we developed over our year-long course to compile groups of primary historical sources and analyze them in an essay prompt. Um, so these are just a few of these long-term projects that I've experienced, um, but the teachers are really um, doing a wonderful job of allowing kids to take more flexibility and um, control over what they're studying in the last month of school. Um, so next Thursday, June 15th at 7.30 p.m. in the Black Box Theater at Northampton High, the Feminist Collective and Gender Sexuality Alliance will present Dysfunctioning Just Fine, which is an autobiographical one-woman musical about the life of, and I'm quoting here, a kind of gay and chronically ill woman. Um, Dysfunctioning Just Fine sets out to expand conversations about disability and diversity, and I really invite you all to attend. Um, in terms of senior events, prom was held on Tuesday. Um, it was held this year at the Tacoa Country Club in Westfield. And due to the rain, prom attendees took photos at Helen Hills Hills Chapel. <coughs> so thank you to Smith College for allowing um, all of the prom attendees to have a lovely place to take photos at. Um, this Sunday is the Northampton High School graduation. Um, so another congratulations to all of the graduates and everyone in our school community. Um, we've all had an impact on them being able to graduate. Um, and that concludes my school committee student report. And again, thank you all. Thank you very much, Elena. The next item on the agenda is a uh, presentation and vote uh, regarding the NEF Small Grant Awards. And Dale Melcher is here from the NEF board to present. Thank you. Um, before I present these grants and ask you to accept these gifts to the Northampton Public Schools, I'd like to thank the school committee for supporting us and participating. I want to particularly thank school committee members Laura Fallon and Elena Fragamini, who have served on the committee and uh, have been hugely helpful. So the Board of the Northampton Education Foundation has approved funding of $18,967 to nine applicants for the spring 2017 grant cycle. I believe you all received copies of this. So I'm just going to quickly go through the grants. Um, the first one for Bridge Street School is a multimedia uh, phys ed curriculum. It went to Craig Murdoch and Jen Derringer and it supports creating a new curriculum for physical education classes by incorporating technology and media into the PE classroom. And that was a grant for $1,772. Teachers are sticklers for details, if nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> the second grant uh, to JFK is, and to Brett Costello is Money Talks. The amount of the grant is $1,095. This is a financial literacy project, which will be open to all students and their parents or guardians. The third grant, also to JFK, goes to Holly Graham and Katie Schofield. 
Scholastic Arts and Writing for $2,500, and this grant will continue Dr. Graham's efforts to create a writer's workshop community for JFK students, in particular motivated eighth graders looking to challenge themselves as writers outside the classroom. And I would like to say that Dr. Graham has been um, having her students submit writing to the Globe Scholastic uh, competition. Our students have done exceedingly well. Um, I have been at the um, presentation for the past few years and have been really impressed with what our students have been doing and we're excited that we've been able to support this. It will be the third and final year, however, for us to support this project. The fourth grant also goes to JFK. We had quite a few wonderful grant proposals from JFK. This is a school-wide reading event for $700. It went to Diana Agen, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Pamela Gothier. It's a school-wide project which will invite students to read the book Chew on This, a highly interesting and engaging nonfiction book about the dangers of fast food and processed food. They're going to be meeting during lunch in the cafeteria. <laughs> 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 I can say no more. Um, the fifth grant also goes to JFK, to the Ocean's 18, to Ellen Kennedy, Steve Sanderson, and Ian Cross. It's a grant for $3,000. They are going, it's called Shadows Beyond Borders. They will be bringing Indonesian puppeteer Putu Rekayasa and his ensemble, the Brothers Kampur, to work with students in the Oceans 8 team to create their own shadow puppets based on traditional designs used in Indonesian wayang or shadow puppet play. And it will work across the curriculum for those team members. The sixth grant is a K through 12 grant. It's called Working to Eliminate Racism. This grant is for $5,000, which represents our maximum grant to uh, collaborations uh, among two or more schools. Uh, this, this is to Deborah Keitch. Thank you. And the NPS Anti-Racism Affinity Group. Now, the overall mission of the Anti-Racism Affinity Group is to support our school community through ongoing development and implementation of intentionally anti-racist culture and practice. This is a district-wide group, and this grant will support them in doing some focus groups and some investigation into what the, um, the experience of community members and students with race in the district to problem solve, to share stories, and to continue planning for district-wide efforts to address racism in the school system. This will be the first year for this grant, and I can say that we are looking forward to an application in subsequent years. Uh, the seventh grant goes to the high school. It's the second year for Life in a Changing Climate. This is a grant for $3,000, and it supports science teachers from the high school. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. I'm reading from the old one. I believe I sent you a corrected version. You have the corrected version. You have the corrected version. I did not print the corrected version. Um, we did fund Life in a Changing Climate, but we funded it as an endowment grant, and you will, no, I'll just keep going. Thanks, Julie. You'll mm -hmm. hear from Mark. So we, we had to kind of straighten out, um, link our two grant processes. So the next grant would be Technology <coughs> at Home here at the high school, uh, submitted by Carissa Fabin for $1,000. Now this grant addresses the growing digital divide among students coming from different class backgrounds by providing Chromebooks, which students will be able to check out of the library. And Ms. Fabin, who is the high school librarian, will also provide training in their use and certify that students know what they're doing with the Chromebooks before they check them out. Um, just want to flag that for the school committee that this is a need that we don't think we can continue to support because it's mostly for materials. And the final grant, uh, also at the high school, goes to Jeremy Whalen. It's $900 for a web design boot camp. Students at the high school are currently working with Mr. Whalen on the NPS website redesign. They will participate in August in a web design boot camp, and then we'll work with Mr. Whalen during the school year to help load new material provided by teachers and staff onto the, re the redesigned 
NPS website. So the NEF would like to <coughs> offer these grants as a gift to the schools, and we ask that you please accept them. I make a motion to accept the NEF small grant awards as presented this evening. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. Any, uh, any debate? <laughs> okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So the grants are gratefully accepted by the school committee. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. And I'd just Thank like you. to echo what Laura said. Tomorrow, 5.30 to 7.30 at Click Workspace, 9 and a half Market Street, as part of Arts Night Out, will be a showcase of the grants for the 2016-2017 school year. And we would welcome your presence and your support. Thank you. So uh, the next item on the agenda, also from the Northampton Education Foundation, is Mark Watts, who will be announcing the NEF Endowment Fund Awards. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I am proud to uh, announce that we have awarded $40,000 to um, three grants for the endowment. We had um, three times as many requests in terms of dollar amounts, at least. It was a wonderful pool of applicants, and it was a most difficult decision in the seven years I've done this endowment uh, decision making. But we have, I think, three great grants for you to we'll hopefully approve. Um, the first one is the one that uh, Dale mentioned uh, incorrectly in the first uh, small grant uh, list, uh, the Audubon uh, Acadia um, Climate Change Project. Um, uh, this is done through Mass Audubon. It's building on a small grant that we did last year. Um, and it will uh, uh, work in, uh, with the Northampton High School, ninth graders, all biology, all kids taking biology, and kids in 11th and 12th taking environmental sciences. Uh, it has in-class lessons related to climate and uh, local data on climate and then field trip to um, uh, Arcadia to 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 uh, to uh, collect that data to basically study uh, one's impact on the on the climate uh, and the like. And this is a ten thousand dollar grant uh, for this coming year. And then we will we are uh, we have given this grant for three years, ten thousand each year. But the question in front of you is the ten thousand for this year. Uh, the second program is Global STEM. This is a phenomenal program that has started uh, uh, at JFK seventh grade and uh, at Jackson Street. And the grant, uh, and it's, it's working with a school in England, uh, collecting science data and working in, 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 uh, presenting the science data with those students in England. Uh, in this grant specific for next year, uh, this is about building boats, uh, uh, sending them over the ocean collecting real-time satellite data and other uh, weather data uh, and uh, um, analyzing that, again, with the school in Coventry, England. Um, uh, fifth graders in Jackson Street and seventh graders in JFK would take part of this grant. This is a $14,000 grant for next year. Uh, the third grant is a continuation of the uh, outdoor school classrooms. Um, we have funded outdoor school classrooms with a variety of small grants on a three-year endowment grant. Um, it's a great program. It's doing incredibly well. It's doing wonderful things. Uh, it needs funding, and we've continued to fund it for two more years. Um, 16,000 for this year and 20 for the next, but the question ahead of you is 16,000. This is, again, as I think it's already been mentioned, and there's a tour on Friday. If you go to click to, to see what these um, uh, 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 garden outdoor classrooms are about, um, the, uh, this is continuing that for all four elementary schools um, in the coming years. So I ask if you could please approve of these that we'd like to give to the Northampton Public Schools. Okay. Make a motion to accept the NEF Endowment Fund Awards as presented. Second. Okay. Motion made and seconded. Did you have a question? Comment? Sure, please. Yeah, I just I, I want to thank you for allowing me and us to vote yes on this stuff you guys just do it's just just so amazing dale and mark i mean this this is the kind of thing that really uh, i know a lot of educators and and they talk about their projects i know a couple that are getting funded they talk about these things all the time it's such a motivating thing for teachers and um 
the diversity of things that you're doing, the number of kids that you're reaching, and I was really paying particular notice to like the current and forward thinking. You're talking about social justice issues, climate issues, equity issues, international education. Um, it's these are just so dynamic and so exciting kinds of things. So um, please keep it up, and I and I, I want to be able to support this as we all do in any way possible. So I'm going to touch base with Laura to see what our involvement has been to date, and I look forward to tomorrow night. Ready to have arrangements to show up. So Great. with my family, Dr. Provost, I may be able to address that last point just a little bit, sure. and also an example of teacher voice in the district. Um, the team that brought this grant forward asked for 15 minutes on the agenda of the last alt meeting, saying that they had basically given the word from NEF that they could support for two more years, but then that's it. So, yeah. what do we do as a district? Um, and we figured the cost for the elementary schools would be about $4,000 a piece, which we anticipate will be probably the amount of additional funds that we're able to give them over the next two years um, if we're able to keep growing the budget the way we have been. And to a person, all of the principals said we will use that $4,000 to keep the school uh, garden programs yeah. growing. It's that important to them. Right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The uh, endowment gifts are gratefully accepted. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so now we'll move into a report. Um, we have uh, Bill Deal here from the Collaborative for Educational Services, and um, I don't know if you want to set this up, Dr. Provost, or? I would just say that um, in the three years that I've been here, uh, Mr. Deal has become a very important colleague for me personally. Um, the collaborative does a lot of work with Northampton Public Schools and does a lot of work bringing districts together to work on common issues. So I think that um, it would be um, instructive for the public and for the committee to hear some of the things that are happening at CES. Excellent. Okay. That's Thank you. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to first of all thank the school committee for giving me time on the agenda. And especially want to thank a couple people on the committee. <coughs> uh, Howard Moore is the representative from Northampton on our board um, and has been a wonderful member, has participated in all our meetings, uh, volunteered for other services, our finance committee, and so on. And so thank you, Howard, for being a wonderful board member and well, representative for Northampton. And uh, Dr. Provost mentioned, um, came about the same time, and we've definitely talked to each other. He's been my mentor around a couple of different issues. It's been a really great collaboration with him in the whole district. So I've been going to all of the school committees that we represent, and there are 33 of them, 36 of them. And this is the 33rd one. <laughs> I doubt the last three will happen for various reasons. So this may be the last one. So I'll meet my goal by the end of June to meet with all the school committees. So I appreciate the time on the agenda. I've got uh, Four different, uh, basically, things I want to cover quickly, and I respect your agenda's time. First of all, who we are. What's, what is a collaborative? Secondly, what we do, especially with Northampton. What are some upcoming things you want to be aware of? And lastly, and probably most important for me, is if there are questions or ideas uh, for the collaborative. Our number one goal is to serve our member districts. So we're always looking for ideas about how we can serve our member districts better, either saving money, developing new programs or services or whatever, and we welcome any kind of advice or suggestions here or in the future. So let me first of all turn your attention to what you got, Scott. We have a few more copies of people. One, two, three. I, I apologize for the packet. I don't want to take much of your time, so there's a lot of information in here that will allow me not to go into too much depth, so you have time to look at these things. So the folder itself basically talks about all the different services we provide, and on the back, this is our 36 member school districts, as well as business services we provide. You can see a whole range of districts. Northampton is probably the biggest district we represent, and we go all the way down to very small districts that have one grade, one classroom per grade, and are losing students and are really in some, some difficult situations. So a whole range of things. But I think it's important to mention that because we see one of our roles as a collaborative as helping to represent and advocate on behalf of small and rural districts in the state. Where the collaborative represents most of them and we can have a voice collectively in helping do that. So that's something we want to mention doing. So you have that. Um, 
The next thing behind that is a chart with multi colors. And we have this chart for every school district. <coughs> and this represents all the different services that Northampton uh, has taken advantage of in this last year. It's this current year, basically. And you can see down the line, almost everything Northampton does take some advantage of. The light orange is special education services. We'll talk about those more in a minute. Um, the Mount Tom Academy, you did have students there, but not this year. Uh, a lot of professional development. I'll show you more about that as well. Technical Assistance, uh, Spiffy Coalition, you're members of that. We also do the PNSA, PNAS survey, completed that. And also our Spiffy folks helped uh, with uh, facilitating the uh, community discussions around your QSORT. And then grant writing and development. I'll uh, mention a couple of things here. We, we help our districts with this in different ways. One way is up until this year, Northampton was part of our Title III consortium. You now have your own consortium, I believe. So we were able to write a grant to bring Title III services to all our districts that had at least one uh, student who was an ELL student. We also, speaking of Global STEM, we worked a couple of years ago with the people who do Global STEM on running a grant to the NSF Foundation, which is very competitive, and we did not get it. But I think Northampton was a member of our consortium going forward, and I think it helped kind of introduce you guys to the idea that then led to the opportunity in the school. So we're glad to do that as well. So a lot of things in that area. Uh, technology, we do a lot with technology with you guys. We customized your student information system, and I hope that's going well. It's actually on the agenda later tonight. Okay. I hope it's a good item on the agenda. <laughs> uh, professional development, a lot of your teachers are taking part in that with us. Uh, we have a technical uh, technology uh, professional learning community people are taking advantage of, and we have a big conference that a number of your teachers went to on technology. Then early childhood, a few things there. You have your own coordinated family and community engagement grant. So Barbara Black runs that, I believe, for Northampton. We collaborate a lot with Barbara, and some of the services we provide to our other districts, uh, you guys take advantage of and vice versa. There's a lot of good synergy there. Um, we have a lot of professional development. I'll show you in a second. And we have done a fair amount of early childhood mental health with your families and a few of your families and your kids. Activities and co cooperative purchasing, you have, you're part of our cooperative purchasing on a lot of different foodstuffs, milk, et cetera. And again, collectively, we were able to save money that we couldn't do individually as small and, and uh, rural districts. So that's a quick overview there. If you go behind that page, you have this sheet, which starts with special education. This basically then just gives you a quick list of, of the numbers we're talking about. Like Academy, which is our academy in town, especially for high school students who are uh, challenged emotionally and behaviorally. Uh, we've had students here, a lot of students here in the past. We had seven this past year, uh, a couple graduated, three graduated from Northampton. Itinerant services, OT, PT, uh, assistive technology cons consultation, and so on. So a lot of those things we're able to help you guys with. I mentioned early childhood and spiffy. On the back of that is a list of the workshops and courses that Northampton contracted with us to do for your teacher, as opposed to kind of uh, 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 workshops that people just sign up for individually. So again, we're really pleased we were able to work with Northampton. We did, for example, SEI teacher endorsement full course uh, last year. Uh, we did a lot with paraprofessionals, uh, trauma training, et cetera. As you can see the list there, and these are all things that happen in your schools. And then the last piece of kind of detailed information comes behind that. And these are all the workshops and individual courses. So these are courses that we do. People sign up for them individually from school districts and have PD based on that. So you can see in the two different pages last two years, a lot of different courses. Some of them taken advantage of by several teachers, some by one. But I think we're able to then provide a kind of a range of PD uh, for your teachers and, and administrators as well that I think really help, help uh, complement the work that you're already doing in your districts. So those, those are those things. Just going behind that, a couple things to point out. Our summer academy is coming up. I have it every summer. It's an academy that is uh, done, it's designed by teachers for teachers. Opportunity for teachers to showcase their work, other teachers, and it's a success every year and a lot of good things going on there. Behind that is our four goals. These are our five-year goals. The first one is meeting member district needs. And let me just do a quick sidestep here just to mention about collaboratives. Um, in 1974, the collaborative was formed, like most other collaboratives in the, state, in the nation. Uh, it was formed because the new, there were new laws about special education that came into effect, 
and districts didn't have the capacity to meet those new needs. So states went one of two ways. A third of the states developed collaboratives. In that case, the school districts came together and formed a collaborative. In two-thirds of the case, the state set up regional collaboratives or service centers that were funded by the state. I make that distinction because I'm very proud of the fact that we're a collaborative. You guys own us. You guys run us. We serve you, um, as opposed to the state telling us what to do to help Northampton. Important distinction. We're proud of that distinction. We receive no money from the state except for grants and contracts. Um, so I think it's an important distinction for you to know about. Second goal is to meet the needs of families, youth, and children. Third one is professional development. And last one is innovative practices. We're always looking for ideas, how we can work with districts and teachers on innovative practices moving forward. Behind that, we have a, this again is a grant thing that we got, Massachusetts Licensure Academy. We have a big licensure program. A number of your teachers taking advantage of it. And we also got a grant from DESE uh, to provide two th free courses uh, towards a modern disabilities license. So for teachers who might want that as a second license, that's there. Behind that is our information about our, our uh, licensure program, some information about our early shadowed programs, and I think the last thing is a low-income education access project. This is something we're doing now. We did to train the trainer for all the toddlers in the Commonwealth, and on the back of that are the topics. The notion here is that we developed a lot of trainings that are really tailored, that can be tailored for districts. So if Dr. Provost calls and says, I really would like to have some uh, training, we have a half day, can you guys come and do some training on the intersection of race, poverty, uh, and special education? We can design that for this purpose. Uh, and in fact, I think we're doing possibly that particular topic for you online, I believe. Um, so these, this is a whole capacity we've developed recently. I want to make sure you're aware of that because I think it will help serve some of your needs. A couple of other things I want to mention before I open up for questions. <coughs> Another thing coming up is we, the collaborative has been very involved with anti-bias work, social justice and equity work for the last three years. And we use Barbara Love and Ross Green Jones as our trainers in that area. And we actually end up with a couple of people who work closely with them working on our staff. So I understand that you guys are going to work with Barbara Love at the end of the summer uh, for a couple of half days, I believe, on anti-bias training. And we're very happy about that. And two of our people are going to help Barbara with that. So we're going to be involved with that to some degree. I, ho I, I was thrilled to hear about the particular grant from the NEF for that kind of work as well internally. So I think that's great work you're doing and very, very important work. I'm um, sure got to be some part of that. And I mentioned before that John and I have, have collaborated on several things. I want to mention some of the advocacy things that we have done. So a year ago, we were a pretty strong voice in terms of the charter schools, especially we, we didn't take sides, but we did educate the community and legislators about how charter schools disproportionately impacted small and rural districts. Northampton, Hadley are hit a lot harder by losing kids to charter schools than is Boston. But the, but the rules are made up for Boston. So we had to have that voice out there about that. John and I co-wrote an editorial for the Gazette around that. Um, we collaborated. We were on a panel about charter schools. Um, we collaborated on a couple of different things around diversifying the education workforce, uh, part of the five colleges initiative in that area, as well as John was a panelist on a, a panel about that at our SJE conference early in the year. And we also, John really took a, a leadership role in terms of messaging to your community and helping other superintendents message to their community about how do, you, how do we respond to some of the things that happened in terms of immigration, uh, banning folks from, from coming to this country and so on, because it really stirs up a community. We have to have a, a very important and very measured uh, message there. And uh, we were part of helping collaborate with the superintendents on developing those messages, which I think were really wonderful. Um, and then the very last thing I want to mention is we also are doing a lot of new work in special education, inclusive practices, paraprofessionals. We're doing a SETLI uh, ETL training statewide. I'm not sure if you guys are part of that or not, John, but I'll let you know more about that if you're interested. Um, and we're always looking for other things to do as well. So I'm, I am so um, honored and humbled by being the director of the collaborative and to be able to work with people like all of you. I said I, I've gone to 33 school committee member meetings, and every one of them I end up almost teary-eyed because here are all you people who are giving of your own time as individual private citizens 
to help keep our, our public education system moving and, go, and doing extremely well. And we have all our teachers involved, many involved for many, many years. It's incredible. So what you do and what the teachers do is we make America great. Not again. <laughs> make America great. I'm really proud of everything that you guys do, and I'm, I'm really humbled to be part of that. So let me see if there are questions or if there are things people might think or this is something collaborative might consider doing. Any questions about the, uh, about the collaborative? Um, I was just curious because I saw on your brochure that you have technology vendor discounts. Have have the technology vendor discounts? Yes. Have we been taking advantage of that for all of these Chromebooks that I feel like if we... we don't have it for Chromebooks. We have, we, don't. We have it for uh, uh, software stuff. Could you get it for Chromebooks? Well, that's a good question. We should look into that. Absolutely. Because, in fact, that's something a lot of districts are doing. Yeah, and, and you just heard, we just, the Northampton Education Foundation just funded more Chromebooks um, for students. So it would be nice to... Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll maybe talk to you, John, about who you're dealing with with that and see what we can do. Because a lot someone, of people someone are, you know oh, quite yes. well. Yes, someone your, your former IT director. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know him. <laughs> it's our CIO. So. Okay. I have one more question. Yes, and please. so I feel like um, Dr. Provost has already run this by you, but you had no interest in the collaborative helping to sort of um, spearhead or organize um, transportation for the homeless students. Um, that we're responsible for transporting, like somehow managing to. We, we, had, we had talked about, and the Amherst superintendent also talked about <clears throat> collaborative getting involved with some of the van uh, transportation for special education students. I don't think we talked about the homeless students. No. So we shouldn't talk about that as well, because that, that, those may be areas, again, where our districts could all benefit and have some cost savings if we did it collectively. Some collaboratives do that, and we're gonna spend this coming year really looking at that carefully and seeing if it's possible. That would be yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. So one other thing I just mentioned that other, I've heard from a number of school committees, is one of the things that they're all struggling with, or many of them struggling with, is the high cost of out-of-district placement for special education. Um, and I think everyone, especially our small districts, if you have a young person move into your district with high special needs, you're obligated to educate them. And you want to educate them. And yet you have a very small budget which to work. So it becomes a major problem for everybody, but for small districts especially. So we have a, we have a survey out right now to special ed directors. We're trying to figure out what, what out of districts uh, placements folks are doing to see if there might be a niche of one or two programs that we could set up locally that would help bring some of those kids back into the region at a more cost effective way and also less for transportation. So that's one of the things we're looking at right now in terms of hopefully helping in some of those things. I had sort of a historical question. So did there used to be a collaborative in Franklin and Berkshire County, and that's how you be, your name changed from HEC to That's right. you subsumed those uh, other collaboratives? That collaborative collapsed long before that happened. It didn't okay. collapse. That's not a good way to say it, but they, they stopped functioning. Okay. Before they, Franklin County joined uh, HEC. So HEC was the Hampshire Education Collaborative, mm -hmm. and when Franklin County joined, they didn't like that name for some reason. So we became the Collaborative <laughs> Educational Services. And at, at, after, I mean, I think we have a very strong collaboration between the counties now. Mm -hmm. It's developed over the last couple of years, and it's really a, a wonderful thing to see. Yeah. We're also doing a little bit of work in the Berkshires now. Very similar issues and problems. And for things like cooperative purchasing, if we can bring them <coughs> those things, everybody will save more money. So we're trying to work with the Berkshires and those kinds of things as well. Okay. Other questions? Well, just, Howard, do you have anything? Yeah, I just have a comment. I think that the... Um, it's, it's easy to see how when you look at this brochure how sort of all over the place this looks, but there is a unifying sort of theme, which is that the initial legislation is that the collaborative is to address what are low incidence things on a school by school basis in a way that's more effective. And so if you look at all these sorts of things, they're things that are very hard for an individual district to do because either they are low incidence in terms of over time, you know, things pop up maybe regularly, but not enough to be able to devote a, you know, a staff person to it. Or, and so sometimes it's issues, and sometimes it's um, particular educational needs of particular students. And so it's a variety of different things like that, but that's really the unifying theme, is all these are things that are very difficult just because of the scale for individual districts to really actually de develop any kind of long-term expertise in. 
whereas the collaborative can do that and, and have have in many ways these sort of consultant roles which aren't aren't what you initially think of when you think of special education these consultant roles are really important because it's they can have a person who can then consult with a variety of different you know, across as you see whatever the, the, the three dozen districts who each will have a need for that consultant but couldn't possibly have somebody with that experience on their payroll at all times and, the, and so it's, that's kind of how it works and I think in our budget it's about nine thousand ten thousand um, dollars three dollars and fifty cents I think per student and um, that's so what we get in exchange for that is this sort of um, a resource that we, as you can see we draw on um, for a variety of different things Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you so much thank again, you, Bill, for joining us, and thanks for the work you guys are doing. Okay. The next item on the agenda is a <coughs> discussion and vote to authorize a football co-op with Hopkins Academy. And I see our uh, athletic director approaching the podium. So, turn it over to you. Kate. <coughs> thank you for having me this evening. Um, on behalf of the Northampton High School football team, I would like to request your authorization for a cooperative agreement with Hopkins Academy. I would also like to acknowledge and apologize for a process error that I made um, with regards to this request. Um, in the spring of 2016, so about this time last year, I worked with Eric Sudnick, who is the athletic director at Hopkins Academy to secure um, a cooperative agreement with Hopkins um, to, for mutually beneficial uh, reasons. Um, one, um, over the last 10 years, we've had a steady decline in our football program participation numbers. Um, and um, we also discovered that we have a relationship at the youth level with Hadley um, and that the Hadley um, young students are uh, allowed to participate in our Northampton Youth Football Organization. They dis through this conversation, we discovered that they don't actually have a place to play football when they get to high school, so they end up abandoning um, their interests there. And we felt as though joining forces um, would be really helpful both for our participation numbers and in reinvigorating our program, and also offering the student athletes at Hopkins Academy another opportunity to participate. Um, I spoke with Principal Brian Lombardi about this opportunity and he offered his full support. He believed it, um, it would really help us to um, reinvigorate the program. Um, then I followed the process that I thought I understood with the MIAA, which is an online application in which we offer data uh, about our uh, enrol total enrollment numbers, our participation numbers over the last five years, the different levels that we've offered, varsity, JV, and freshman programming, um, as well as students who will be graduating, potential numbers of students who will be coming into the program, and then also interest um, that the athletic director at Hopkins has been able to, was able to gather um, with his student body. Um, the MIAA has given District F, which is the district in which our school and Hopkins Academy and 49 other schools in Western Mass um, all belong to, they, they gave District F the, uh, the opportunity or the right to vote on cooperative and middle school waivers at the local level because of the burden of having to travel out to Franklin to make those kind of decisions. So District F athletic directors voted and approved the cooperative agreement in the spring of last year. And um, starting this past September, um, four student athletes from Hopkins Academy participated on our football team. When they were registering for our program, um, I assessed them the same user fee that our student athletes pay, uh, pay which is $225 and realize now, both in the process and um, in reflection, that that is not my judgment call. That's actually your judgment call, both in uh, approving the cooperative agreement and also uh, deciding what the user fee would be for students who'd be coming from a different district. So this evening, I ask for your support for the cooperative, cooperative agreement for the second year um, and also uh, offer my apologies for making the process error. Okay. So, um, 
I guess the um, issue, well, we can have questions. The question <laughs> is we'll have to actually make a motion to approve a co-op, but sure. certainly we can start with questions if we want. I just have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> so I know that our student athletes, they have pretty um, strict guidelines for behavior and um, such. Are those, are those athletes from Hopkins Academy going to be held to the same standards of conduct? And there, the same training requirements as far as I know you have um, each season the, the athletes need to come for training for like parent night oh okay um, so um, in terms of behavior conduct ac academics attendance um, the general procedure is that for academics the student athletes must adhere to our requirements unless their requirements are more rigorous than ours. So in our situation, a student athlete um, must pass um, six of eight courses in the spring to be academically eligible in the fall to participate on the football team. If Hopkins Academy has something more uh, rigorous than that requirement, then they would adhere to their own policy, but they must meet our at least our minimum requirement. In terms of attendance, it's the same thing, and it's uh, a matter of the two athletic directors communicating daily about the attendance um, requirements, and that's a, generally a quick email letting me know that their students are or, not, are or are not um, eligible because of their participation in school that day. Um, in terms of conduct, they would have to adhere to whatever their levels of conduct and behavior are, which um, for Eligibility purposes are standard across the MIAA, so Hopkins Academy and Northampton High School would adhere to the same good citizenship rules, chemical health policies, um, et cetera. Um, I would, I have, uh, it, last fall, this past fall, I did expect that the student athletes and their families would attend the fall sports night, and they are expected to go to the parent meetings that, um, that the individual coaches also host. And then my only other question is, so it sounds like you're doing two year, it's like a two year renewed, like at, what's the tipping point where if, is it still a Northampton team if you end up with so many students and at what point do they start picking up some of the costs, <coughs> say transportation and field maintenance and stuff like that? So um, the MIA requires that we reapply every two years for cooperative agreements so that you do have the opportunity to reassess the situation. Um, in, um, it, if it turns out that the enrollment shifts and there are more student athletes who um, are participating from Hopkins Academy than from Northampton High School, the MIA requires that Hopkins <coughs> Academy is now the host and um, that they are responsible for the football program or whatever program you might be referring to. Um, their user fee that I've uh, recommended, the, the $500 user fee, um, would both cover the base user fee that we expect of our student athletes and also help offset the cost of some of those other um, uh, expenses that you've just outlined. Thank you. Anne and then Lonnie. I love, um, thank you for admitting the mistake, which didn't seem like no one died, but <laughs> it's so nice in the public that we hear that. Um, so three questions, gate receipts, do they get any of it or do we still keep all gate receipts? No, the, um, the process would be that at the end of the season we would, um, we would bill them the $500 and that would, uh, per, per student athlete, right. and Hopkins Academy would pay Northampton Public Schools that fee. Um, and so the, the money doesn't change hands that in right. the other way. So they don't get any money of... They don't get any, no, they do not. Um, transporting kids to here, how does that... That is their responsibility or their parents' responsibility to get them to practice. And then the regular transportation with busing to and from games, would they would be on our buses for those events. Okay. And then the last one, if, if someone, if one of those students gets injured at our school... Is there, is, is there any issue with that? Like, so that would be my responsibility to communicate that with the athletic director at Hopkins Academy. Our trainer would also be responsible for communicating directly with his or her parents um, uh, that the person was injured and uh, recommended course of action, whether it be go to the hospital or doctor's visit or so on. Liability, that's us. That we, yeah. They would yeah. be covered on, yep. Great, thank you. Sure. Lonnie. I'm curious, um, so, have the number of kids participating in football been uh, decreasing? 
Yeah, so after the last, over the last 10 years, they've yeah. declined. Um, so we, we at our height, yeah. we're somewhere in the 60s. Um, and last year, uh, we finished with 38, mm -hmm. and that included the four students from okay. yeah. Hopkins. So um, going into this fall, we graduate 18 of those 38. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a preseason meeting last week, and we had 25 <coughs> interested participants. Um, uh, I'm not sure of those 25 how many will make the yeah. commitment. But okay. I had one more question, but just as a follow-up, do you have any idea why that's occurring? Um, Anecdotally, I think yeah. families are concerned about the concussion yeah. um, uh, uh, situation that's happening all yeah. across the country. Right. Um, they're, they, the changes at the youth level across the country are slow in terms of technique and, and recommending um, that we don't teach hitting or um, when students are in sixth grade. Um, the science right now says it's really sort of unnecessary to be teaching those skills at such a young age, but it, um, youth programs are often, they take a little longer to be able to educate volunteers and parents yeah. about that kind of right. stuff. So, but you're pretty sure that's the reason why? I would say that's probably a large factor, yes. Yeah. And then one more question. So can you just give us some feedback on how it's going so far? Is it, is it working? Are there, is there any tension? The is it? No, the four student athletes who participated last year have already been emailing me about wanting to come back this year, and yeah. and I said, I, hold on, um, I I have to, get, <laughs> I, sh I should have asked for a, a permission instead of for forgiveness, and right. so we're we're back backing up track a little bit. But what now, about our students have they mentioned anything to you? In um, terms of the, how they feel about Hopkins kids? Oh, they I think they have such great pride in our program that whatever we need to do to help keep the program going yeah. is what's most important to them. Sure. Um, yeah. And I think kids are, with the way social media is today, they're far more connected than they probably would have been in terms of rivalries even 20 years ago or right. something like that, so. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Moore. Yeah, I'd like to note another possible, well, not a possible, a certain reason why the decline in numbers is that Smith Folk used to be part of a, a part of a, the same arrangement with Northampton High up until I think it was about four years ago. Um, not that long ago. And so, yes. So Smith Folk was a cooperative <coughs> with North, under Northampton's umbrella and pulled out and formed their own football team. Oh, sure. And so that's a pretty large, right. they, have a, they had enough kids to have a football team at Smith Folk who at that point were no longer being part of the Northampton football team. So I think that is a <coughs> pretty big chunk of the right. participation. That is, that is correct also. Although I think Smith Folk might be I'd be coming back <laughs> soon. Right, exactly. We have talked about that. I yeah. don't think they're quite ready yet. Um, I think they, they really are committed to making it work, but mm -hmm. they're also recognized that we are dividing our, our, uh, our resources, I guess you could say, um, both with, with the, the cost of the football program and also offering a, a vibrant experience for both, both yeah. sets of kids. So. Okay. I, just, I, heard, I had heard that their census for football was also starting to shrink a little bit. Yes, so, yes. Yeah. Um, other questions? Could you just talk about how you came up with the $500 user fee? You just said that, I mean, I know football is an expensive sport, and with um, with another school coming in and participating, I, I know that the athletic fee that we charge doesn't totally cost what the program costs to run, and I'm wondering, um, does the number that you came up with kind of include some sort of um, additional support to the district to kind of cover more of the true cost per player? Yes. So um, in making my recommendation, I tried to balance um, what the actual cost per person is to run the football program and also the, the, the reality of, a, um, of another program being able to afford um, the, the full cost, I guess you could say. So the $500 um, is to cover the 225 that we ask our student athletes to, to pay um, and then to cover additional costs to be able to alleviate some of that pressure um, of, the, of the total cost of the program. Um, so. We have a similar fee for hockey, correct? Or we pay we, that? We do, yes. Um, What's that one again? So that so each cooperative agreement operates differently, yeah. um, and so with uh, the East Hampton Ice Hockey Cooperative, they um, uh, as they add the entire the total cost of the program together. They reduce the gate receipts and um, any donations that they receive, and then they divide it by 
every participant and bill each program um, that fee times however many students they have. Depending on how many students we have in the whole program, it has fluctuated from about $500 per student to um, $775 per student. Um, and we've asked in our user fee structure for our kids to pick up a little bit more of that with, with the ice hockey user fee. Um, and then we cover the rest. Okay. Elena. Um, so I'm assuming we have some sort of like fee waiver for um, kids on free or reduced lunch for the athletic program? We do. So if there were students at Hopkins who are on free or reduced lunch, um, will their school pick up those fee waivers? So yes, so um, their school will be responsible per, for paying the $500 fee regardless of what their students are able to pay um, to their school themselves. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Only tangentially, but are we expecting also to be in the cooperative for um, in the long meadow hockey? Um, it was uh, the girls had a really outstanding experience. Um, from what I understand, we will only have one returning um, because uh, one has graduated, and um, we have a few years in between where there are no girls coming up that would like to play. Um, when that happens, the host school will ask to officially drop us from the, the official list, but grandfather that one individual through the program so that they can stay on. Um, and the MIAA allows for that grandfathering of students even if a cooperative is dropped. It's Quick question, is, material, is uh, equipment one of the primary costs? Um, it's coaches' salaries, or stipends, not salaries, um, and transportation. Uh, where does equipment? Um, it, uh, maybe third, I would say, because we have to um, go through the reconditioning process of all of our safety equipment every yeah. year, yeah. and that is probably the third highest cost. Is that something that is cooperatively purchased? Is there any savings potentially with that? It is, it is not cooperatively purchased. It's our responsibility to offer those that material to them. Yeah. Um, we do not, I do not foresee having to pay any additional costs than we already budgeted to be able to yeah. have these folks in the program. I just mean, um, is there a cost savings based on what had Bill had talked about before? Is there a cost savings that potentially yeah. like that into the, into the cooperative, the CES cooperative? What's that? You're saying the CES cooperative versus the cooperative. Yeah. yeah, I mean, every team has. That, if that's a big cost, and every team has to repurchase shoulder pads or I see across all sports. I mean, that's expensive. That's an excellent question. I don't, I don't have the answer. Um, I imagine that the folks who sell us their helmets, helmets would not want to have an agreement like that, but um, I will look into it. Uh, <laughs> right, it's a really lucrative business on their end of things, I if, think. If they're selling 500 yeah. helmets versus Absolutely. 100, they, they would. That's I mean, a, yeah. Everybody benefits from that. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. Yeah. I can look into that. Hopefully they would look different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you don't want to wear oil purple. Right. You know? <laughs> All right. I'm going to uh, make a motion to authorize the football co-op with Hopkins Academy. Second. Okay. There's been a motion made and seconded. Any other uh, questions or? Clarification. Does the user fee need to be included or would that be a separate vote? Um, uh, you can certainly. Um, I think your, your your motion was to approve the co-op as proposed, including the $500 fee, if I heard it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And so, okay. So does that uh, so that mm -hmm. just to have that in the record that the $500 fee. So okay. Uh, any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for your patience as uh, <laughs> we worked through this. I appreciate it. Okay. The uh, next item on the agenda is a budget transfer to create an NHS adjustment counselor position. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Provost. Yes, this is a, a transfer request that will stay within the cost center and same type of services. <coughs> when we had presented the budget, the um, Intention was to take the money left from the Linda Pickling position that was left vacant to create another academic support position at the high school. As the high school administration has thought through implementation and the needs of their students, they've um, sort of 
change their minds with the best use of that money. Um, I don't think it's surprising. When we were in the budget discussions, we talked about the high case loads uh, for counseling services at the high school. We have um, one counselor there who has more than 80 students on his caseload. And their thinking at this time is that the money that was originally um, earmarked for academic support could really be better used for social emotional support. Additionally, we had an opportunity to save some money by insourcing some special education services through the Catherine Kurtz position that's summarized in your memo. So we're now able to make that full time. And so the recommendation is to transfer the money out of the teacher account where we have not filled the position yet into a counselor account where we would hope to fill the position. Okay. Um, would you like to make a motion on that one? Sure. Uh, I make a motion to uh, approve the budget transfer to create an NHS adjustment counselor position. Second. Seconded by Mr. Moore. Any uh, questions about that? Oh, sorry, Ms. Fallon. Um, so, so I understand what you're saying and that the priorities for the adjustment counselor position, but do we still need that academic support person? In my discussions with the high school administration, the, they certainly have kids who are presenting with academic needs solely, social emotional needs solely, and combination of both academic and social emotional needs. They have made adjustments <clears throat> to the programming and staff, staffing that have helped them get a better handle on the academic needs. I think what they're finding are the needs that are rising to the surface and really um, impacting the services they provide to kids are, are more social, emotional, and behavioral of nature at this time. So it's not just a, we need both, but we need this one more? Like you've managed to kind of? I think it would be that um, it is a little bit of that, okay. but I, I think they've been able to make some adjustments on the academic side that they're feeling a little bit better about. Um, they haven't been able to make any adjustments on the social emotional side because we haven't provided any additional resources there. Um, and they are, this is part of the high needs future. You know, they're just on the very beginning edge of it. They're just seeing the, the first um, sort of wave of those kids. And they have found themselves to be really understaffed in meeting the needs of their current students with social emotional needs and thinking ahead to the incoming freshmen feel that that will be an even greater need next year so they feel this would be better use of their resource not to say they've completely solved the academic support issue but to say that this is where they see the priority need at this time any other questions about the transfer hearing none all those in favor please say aye, aye. opposed any abstentions Next, we have a second budget transfer. This is to create an evaluation team leader position. And this will also sort of continue with that theme. At the middle school, one of the associate principals right now is, has special education responsibilities as a significant component of the job. What has happened over the course of this past year is those special education um, duties have essentially consumed 80 to 90 percent of the principal's time. At the same time, the middle school is in experiencing an increase in number of students who require social emotional support. That support is provided either by counselors or provided by administrators if the behaviors are more significant. So this position uh, was not something that was in play at the time of the budget. It becomes a possible move to make because we had an unexpected retirement. And so the proposal would be to use the money from the retirement to create an ETL position. The ETL would be responsible for the special education parts of the job that the principal, associate principal is currently doing. And that would have two benefits. It would make her immediately available to provide more direct services to kids. And another thing that happens because her time is, is tied up with special education is <coughs> the test administration uh, responsibilities have been shifted on to the counseling department. So the counseling department does 
an excellent job with test administration, but they essentially shut down for almost six weeks when MCAS is, is in session. So now you have kids who can't go to their counselor and can't go to the associate principal. And so the hope is that using the money from the reading and math position to create an ETL will solve both of those problems because the principal will be providing direct services through most of the year, take on the responsibilities for test coordination during MCAS time, and that would le leave the counseling suite open for students to receive direct services during testing season. Any questions about that? Can you explain a little bit more about the, what's the position that's being, that is not being filled? It is a reading and math support position, so very similar to the high school. Um, it's a position, I believe, funded by Title I for students who need support in, um, because they're significantly below grade level in reading and math. Yeah. The decision um, was looked at in terms of enrollments. Enrollment this past year was pretty small in that class. Um, or all the classes supported by that teacher. Our best guess, it, based on the achievement data for students in fifth grade going into sixth grade, is we think it will be about the same level of, of academic support need. Um, so we probably could have, um, in the current year, absorbed those kids into other support positions in the, in the middle school and anticipate we'll be able to do that for next year as well. So we can use Title I money to hire that ETL? Um, no, we would probably. This position is not paid by Title I. It performs the same function as the Title I teachers, but it's actually one that the budget has picked up over the years. So it is local funding. Um, thank you. Sure, now I get that. The ETL or the Title I? The, it, it's not, she's not a Title I teacher. She's an academic support teacher. So she, it's the same function as somebody in Title I might be. The person the, who's retiring. The person who's retiring, okay. but her funding was out of the local budget. We pay for a number of what people traditionally call Title I teachers. Yeah. I call academic support teachers. We pay for a lot of them out of the local budget. Okay. So just to make sure I understand, are you saying that the kids that are going to need that support will still be getting it because there's less students coming up? And we have other academic support teachers who will still be available then. Make a motion to approve the budget transfer to create the evaluation team leader position. Second. Okay. Motion's made and seconded by Mr. Meyer. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that transfer is approved. Next, we need a vote to create a student activity uh, sub accounts at both JFK and Northampton High School. And I'll ask Ms. Walczak. Yes, um, working through a number of issues with, in the student activity accounts with Principal Lombardi and Principal Wilson, one of the things that we've discussed that actually had come up in our last audit was looking at different ways that we can provide financial support to students. Uh, maybe even 10 years ago, the interest earnings on these accounts were pretty substantial and it allowed, the laws allow the principal to designate some of those interest earnings to support kids who can't afford to pay for some of the activities. Interest, as we all know, has dropped down. These accounts are earning almost nothing now. So the schools have really been struggling, um, both as the funds go down and the need goes up, on a way to be able to support kids who can't afford some of the activities. We don't know that this will help a lot, but one of the proposals that we're asking you to approve is within our student activity account at each building, so each school has their own. Within that, they already have what I call sub-accounts for each of their clubs, or each senior class, junior class, the various clubs they all have. We're asking you to approve another sub-account called st Student Financial Assistance. Money could go into that in a couple of different ways. We could accept donations into that account if somebody wants to make it, and once the accounts are set up, if you approve them, we will look at how can we go about trying to solicit donations to those accounts. Um, and the money also could go in if a club at one of the schools has been inactive for two or three years. Audit guidelines recommend that those funds be moved elsewhere. It requires that the principal come to the school committee and say, I've got $500 in a chess club account, we haven't had a chess club in three years, we'd like to transfer those monies to this account. Um, we've got a few of those accounts in particular at the high school that we probably will come to you in the future if this is approved and ask you to transfer the funds from an inactive club account 
into the student financial assistance account. So there's a couple of ways monies may go in. We don't know if it's really going to result in, in a lot or not. It's something we'd like to try. We had to look very carefully at how do we do this because student activity accounts are trust funds of student monies. They're not city monies. They're not managed in the same way. I have some oversight, but most of the oversight's at the principal's level. Um, the kids have to be involved in every decision. So every deposit into a student activity account has to be signed off by the class treasurer, the student club treasurer, the class president. Every expenditure out has to be. And, and we have a dual signature. It's a student in the club or class as well as the advisor. So there's some control there. The reason for that is the law that authorized these accounts to exist rather than put them just under the city was a law that recognized the need to educate kids on handling money. Is that true at the elementary schools or just the? Very few elementary schools have student activity okay, accounts. So for they all had student activity accounts, but. Middle and high school only middle. here. And most districts, it's only middle high school because okay. it's, it's a little harder to get the elementary kids involved. Okay. So everything that goes on is with the approval of a child, a, a student in that class or club signing for the money in and the money going out. This gets a little touchier because we don't want the kids to know where the financial need is. So what we're looking at in both cases is involving the student unions, student council at the middle school, having a club, and would most likely be the advisor, who recognizes a need for some financial assistance for kids in that activity to go to the principal. The principal would bring the request to the student union, student council, and based on the money they've got available and the needs they're hearing, the students would make a decision on how much money to direct towards that activity to help. We're hoping that can also be done in an instructional way to, again, start to teach the kids how the financial needs are out there and how they can, they can help to meet those needs for some of their fellow students without any identification of who those students are. It's new. We'd like to give it a try, so we're asking your approval to set those, that one sub-account up in each building. Make a motion to create student activity sub-accounts at JFK and North Ham High School. Is there a second for second. purposes of discussion? Um, you had a question, and then Ms. Fragamini had a question. I was just, so I know how specific the student activity accounts each have to be, like the, but this sub-account is allowed to then, you could give it out to any group? Like, do you know what I'm saying? So <coughs> this sub-account does not. It could be a general assistance fund, and it could give money to individual clubs, or does it go only to individual students? Clubs. So we'd be looking at a structure where, um, I'm drawing, drawing a blank. The, the, the yearbook. The high school yearbook charges the kids for the yearbook. Not every student can afford it. There's a cost of production where they have to get the monies in to produce the yearbook. So the, the yearbook advisor may realize that they could use some financial assistance to maybe offset the cost of the yearbook from some, for some students to be able to get them. He would bring that to the attention of the principal, ask for some financial assistance. The principal would then take it at the high school to the student union. They would have a discussion around the need, how much money do they have available, and through a discussion within that group, say, okay, we can direct $100 to the yearbook club. So they would have no knowledge of who the students were that it was assisting. I guess that's my question, is if there's no specific student activity account for that activity, then you can't use this to fund it. Is that if there's no if Like there's, you don't have like a prom fund, or do you? I guess you They do. do. Well, the so prom is usually have. under a class. So, so, there, so as long as, as long as we already have an existing student activity account for yes, and pretty for. much every club and at the high school level, every <coughs> class, and at the middle school, almost every team okay, already so has an existing account. Yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of clubs at so the middle for, like, school trips too. So for and stuff like that, it would go through either the team or through. Okay. Yeah, usually they're through the teams. Okay. Thank you. Lena. Um. So I have a couple questions. I, I guess I just don't really understand the the parameters mm -hmm. of like what would qualify like a student in need is it is it only that like a club can request a need or would an individual student say they need like a, a waiver for something or like in our field trip conversation some sort of assistance monetarily for field trips could an individual student go to our principal and then go to the student union that's not the intent for this that's the not. intent would be for I'm gonna say the club it might be a class um, Every activity in student activity is a little bit different, so some are a little, some are more geared to one student than others, but we really don't want to get into, we're not going to have a lot of money. This is not a way that we're going to be able to subsidize every student who may need assistance, but if a club is, if, for example, they're putting on the prom, besides the prom tickets, there's overall costs they're running that prom. 
So if they give, if the school gives out waivers or reduced prom tickets to kids that have needs, they still need to pay the bills for running the prom. Okay. So it would be a way for the, the prom committee, working with the advisor, the class advisor, to go to the principal and say, you know, we've, we've given out 10 waivers. I don't really have numbers of waivers in my head for these, but we've given out 10 waivers, but we still have a bill of $25,000 to hold the prom, so the waivers, <coughs> we have $800 less in income coming in. Can we get some assistance to make that up? Because otherwise, somebody's got to come up with that money, which is probably more fundraising for the kids. Um, so just for, for me bringing it back to the student union, it can almost be phrased as like a club or activity in need versus like a student in need. Yeah. The, the club or activity need would be caused by student need, but we want to keep that blind. So we're not talking about a club wants to do something and just doesn't have enough money. This is a student a financial assistance sub count. It's a long name. but um, So the need can't be, gee, we didn't make enough money at the bake sale to pay for what we want to do. The need is really going to be, th in this case, the need would be tied to a waiver or reduced cost for students who can't pay, which then results in a shortfall for that overall activity or, or club. Okay, thank you. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I'm, I am a little confused. Um, the, when we were talking about uh, the field trip, um, the issue of trying to get more low-income students able to go on overseas field trips in our rules and policy subcommittee meeting, superintendent had a really wonderful solution, which was to create some sort of revolving fund uh, that was at the discretion of the principal so that if he or she knew of a student who wanted to participate in something but couldn't afford it, then that would be something that the principal could fund. So I just don't understand. I love the, the, what you're trying to do, and I just don't understand why it wouldn't just be a fund that was at the principal's discretion rather than involving students if you're trying to create some anonymity for the students in need. If we come up with a revolving fund that the principals can use, I mean, that mechanism hasn't been set up yet, and it hasn't, doesn't have money in it, that could be a secondary way. But student activity accounts by law are trust funds of student money. So the okay. principals cannot make a decision. And I, that's one thing, because I was around when I begged the state, I was on the committee <laughs> when we begged the state to let us have these so that kids could learn about money. And Department of Revenue was one of the people opposing it, and the educational piece was the part that swung it. So, so student activity accounts are near and dear to me, because early in my career I was down in Boston arguing for this. So I am adamant that nothing goes through for deposits or withdrawals without the involvement of the students in that club or class. So a principal can't say, I've got some money in this student activity account, mm -hmm. because we did a building-wide fundraiser and we've got money, so I, the principal, want to do that. That's not acceptable, because the money belongs to the kids. So the student council or whatever club it is has to be involved with it. So there may be two mechanisms. If we figure out how to set up that revolving account and get money in it, that could be a second mechanism to be used. And we don't know right now if either one of these is going to work. Hopefully they both will work. Ann? This is very interesting. My only concern is that determination being made for who gets it, who the student in need. I get, I get that students aren't going to know the name. Um, it gets tricky for me, though, in terms of who the, is it the, the student council, is it the club, and is, and I trust teachers, I trust, uh, I'm not trust, it's not an issue of that, it's a more how do we know that that kid, that student needs that. So how, what will that look like? That's where I'm very confused. Well, the, the easiest way not the only way, but the easiest way to know if there's a financial need is if the child is el eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Um, and usually when the parents are signing up for that, they're signing a information sharing agreement that says that we can share their status for other appropriate things so that they might get waivers for field trips, they might get a waiver. So that the Program, and again, every club runs differently, so I can't give you a statement on every one, but there are some trips that this trip is going to happen and the child doesn't pay because they can't afford to pay, but the trip still happens. Mm -hmm. That trip cost is still going to be the same whether three kids pay or don't yeah, pay. Because no. it's an, so in that case, the, the advisor working with the, the club or the class may say, well, you know, we've given out four waivers. That has a value of $150. Can we get some assistance to help us pay the bill? So it's... 
It's, it's indirectly helping a student, but we're not talking about it being the student. So that field trip may be short $150 because they gave out waivers, they're letting the kids go who can't afford to, but the bill is the same because somebody has to pay for it. So rather than asking all the kids to fundraise and see if everybody can come up with another 5 or $10, which mm -hmm. is hard to keep that hidden from, from kids too, this would be another way to say, well, maybe instead of asking each kid to, each mm -hmm. child who can to raise 5 or $10 more, we're going to see if there's money in this account that can subsidize it instead. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot of money right now, so yeah. this, is, this is a real test. I, I haven't done anything like this before either. Okay. Um, Rebecca, and then Lonnie. Um, I, I like the idea of it overall. <coughs> what seems tricky to me is that, you know, having been, you know, worked on PTOs with small grants, with rolling small grants, is if there's this small amount of money, won't it be hard to figure out how much money the student union could actually give to each club, right? Because you're going to have different clubs coming to you at different times. During it will be hard. We will be, be training them to be our future school committee people. Right. <laughs> it will be. I mean, so we that's... We get a once a year budget. <laughs> it's, it's, and I mean, hopefully we, hopefully we can get some donations and get some money in there. But if we don't, this idea may not work mm -hmm. either. I mean, we're, we're just as we're, we're trying to struggle with how do we deal with the debt in school lunch, I don't really want to call this debt, but this is a need for financials to support the, the students who can't pay for something. Um, they're not going to be easy decisions. Anytime you're dealing with a lot of need and a little money, mm -hmm. it's not easy. And hopefully there will be some educational value in how that gets handled right, between absolutely. the groups that are making the decision. And they'll come to realize that some of these decisions are really hard. When you put that up against that you're trying to make some decisions in the fall and you have no idea what kind of decisions you're going to need to be or what requests you're going to have in the spring, are you holding back money for something that may never come? Are you not holding back? I think back? that's going to be up to the a, student union or yeah. student council at the middle school. I don't know that the intent here was not to design it to that level. Yeah. I, I really appreciate your thinking, and, and it sounds well thought out, and it sounds like we have to wait and see how this whole thing goes, in, in a sense. So if it's successful, do you feel confident, though, that there's enough oversight and enough sort of um, somebody to let to inform the student groups and to inform people how to make these decisions? It seems pretty complicated. Is, there, is this going to be onerous for, for yourself, or who's, who's going to manage the whole well, the, the advisor to the student union or the student council would be working with the students at that level with the decision making. Yeah. The principal will be involved in it. I'm actually not involved at that yeah, level. Right. So are they prepared for this? Do you feel confident that this is? I've worked with the two principals and the two bookkeepers that are involved. I haven't met with the advisors. But, but the, principals are, the principals are both supporting yeah. it. No, I, I'm totally supportive, too. And if you could, you know, as a, I'm a program evaluator, so is there something that you can, can you make a commitment to coming back in six months or? next year and let us know how it turned out and I'm sure there's going to be some hiccups but love to kind of help to formulate and some feedback and make it even better. <laughs> it's new and you know you'll, you'll experience some stuff but can you yeah we need sure to actually up to date on that we need to actually start giving you some reports on student activities at yeah. the end of each year so this could be a part of yeah. and we have to structure that yet but this mm -hmm. could be a part of the report a year from now right can you feedback on lessons learned and how we can support in the future if it's successful because I like the intention a lot yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Fragamini. Um, so just to answer your question a little bit, um, Student Union does have an advisor, and we technically already have some sort of fund, some source of money um, that when we formed our union, so yep. we have dealt with these requests, and we have an advisor, and we've already dealt with um, some pool of money that um, people have come to us with suggestions that we've used to um, pay for certain things. Um, and a question for you is, um, is the Student Union like allowed to fundraise for this uh, student financial assistance account? I would say yes. Any student group is allowed to fundraise, so I don't see why they could not. Mm -hmm. um, and if we get the word out in the community, I'd like to hope that we would also get donations that we could then, you know, the person could direct the donation go to the financial assistance account, student assistance. And then in terms of what you all are voting here tonight, it's just to set up the account, then is it the responsible of Principal Lombardi to then give the union the ability to be that student signature on it? Or are we voting to have the student union be, or have the student councils? Like is it, after this vote, is it then up to our principals to decide? I think where the student I would, 
my intent was that the vote tonight would say that the student financial assistant subaccount is set up and under the parameters here it goes to the student union or the student council okay. to handle now right now there's no money so one of the, the first thing we'll be looking at is at both schools are there any funds sitting in clubs that haven't been active in two or three years that we can come to a future meeting to transfer um, the, the bigger role for the student union and student council may be around the fundraising, but I, I do think fundraising is completely appropriate. Thank you. Okay. Do we have a motion on this? Made and seconded. Made and seconded. I lost track. Um, <laughs> any, um, any other comments or discussion? So uh, the vote is then on establishing these sub accounts for JFK and NHS student activities. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Now we will move into a presentation by Dr. Provost on the 2015 to 2020. So we've had a number of financial items that um, may have been a little bit dry. So let's talk about fish. <laughs> um, this is a graphic which is circulating through the district. It's a product of the DIP DCP joint labor management team um, as part of our efforts to educate the community on what's included in the DIP and our progress on it and one day a, a committee member saw one of these posters floating around and asked could we have more discussion on what the fish mean so this is unlike the plates a place where my choice did not win. There were actually two versions of this graphic. One was filling up jars with pebbles and the other was fish, schools of fish. Both were meant to convey the same idea that the district improvement plan is meant to be a cumulative process. It's not checking off boxes in one year to completely abandon whatever progress we made and then go on to something different in the second and third year. The idea is those first year activities continue and carry on through and we just don't provide the same kind of energy to standing them up and getting them started. They try to get them to a point where they're more or less autonomous and able to move forward and then we put our energy into getting the new things going. So the one little piece I did win on this was originally it had fish hooks and so we got <laughs> the hooks out of there. Um, and so this graphic basically shows the first three years of the five-year plan. Now, obviously, there are some limitations here. The, the schools are getting kind of big. I don't, you know, by year 2020, the, it would take a page just to do one, one school of fish. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you tonight. It sort of brings together some of the concepts we've been talking about earlier this evening, including the idea of program evaluation, which will be a part of this. But just to sort of walk through what's been done so far and what this means. So let me say that this right here is my growing edge. This is my first scratch project. Uh, and I'm sure that there are probably hundreds of fourth graders in the district who could have done it better. But when I looked at the, the poster, I said, how can I make this more interesting for the committee? Well, fish have to swim. So um, we'll let the fish swim while I talk. This is the year one activities, and we started with the idea of unified mindset, which was a concept that wasn't easy to talk about at first, it wasn't easy to articulate at first, but really comes down to this. There's a very natural tendency for individuals to identify with the part of the organization that they know best instead of seeing the big picture. It's an age-old problem. It's uh, something that I think Pat Summit who's the winningest coach in NCAA wins basketball, had in mind when she said, teamwork doesn't come naturally. Let's face it, we're all born with certain inclinations, and sharing isn't one of them. So 
We started with the idea of a unified mindset because in order for the district to function at its highest level, we need each individual to see beyond their limited perspective of a classroom or a school or a program and to try to have in mind the overall health of the organization and how their decisions and their behavior can make the whole organization more effective or less effective. So the unified mindset really is the countermeasure to the infighting, jealousies, and resource guarding that plagues every organization. It's a problem as old as organizations themselves, and it's the thing that we wanted to take on first because we thought that getting a handle on that would be a force multiplier. Something that we continue to work on, something that we're certainly not 100% there on, but we've made so much progress. And to go back to an example I gave earlier this, this evening, when the group of teachers came before the ALT team to advocate for the school garden program, they said, we need to have a teacher from every elementary school. And one of the things they said was, we need to have a unified mindset here. You know, it doesn't make sense for this to be a school by school decision. It will split the community. People will want to be in schools that have gardens or schools that have decided to spend their resources other ways. We need to know as a team, is this something that's important enough to all of us? So I think that's um, sort of a good example and really gratifying to me that the teachers making the pitch to the administrators said, remember the unified mindset. That's very important for us. So. That was sort of the first task we took on in year one. Second uh, initiative, the fish have stopped swimming now, but um, was RTI. We've had our own presentations on RTI here, so I won't um, go into them to much detail here, other than to say that is a process that goes through an evaluation every year. We call it a stakeholders evaluation. We in involve teachers, parents of kids who've received services. We talk about what went well and what could have gone better. So our second iteration of RTI was better than our first iteration. We're getting ready to have our stakeholders meeting for year two, and I'm very confident that year three will be even better. Our final initiative in year one was to provide teachers with a dashboard that would allow them to see all of the relevant student information in a single shot. Um, and again, we used sort of a pull rather than push philosophy for this. Through the DIP, DCP team, we, at, we surveyed teachers on what types of information would be helpful for them to get in a, a sort of at a, at a glance report. The information exists, but it exists in a lot of databases that don't know how to communicate with each other. And so our thought was, if we could make it easy for teachers to get information that they thought was important, then they could use that to inform instruction. And that was a CES project. As we started looking at the databases that we had and what we wanted to do, we realized there really wasn't any existing product on the market that really met the teacher's needs. And so we worked, we asked CES if they could design something for us. They gave us a proof of concept which they then subcontracted out to another provider. And we ended up having a very um, locked in competitive rate for this because essentially we were the ones who developed the product, or at least the, the conceptual part of the product. So this is something that you may see going to other districts in the future. So let me just give you a, an example of what the dashboard looks like. Mindshine is the subcontractor that CES is using, and you'll see this is very, very, very um, redacted data. We completely took out the teacher and course and section and even year information and all the student names. We masked the rest of it because at a certain point I felt like, well, if I just redact everything, it'll be a blank page and it'll say big deal. Um, but what this shows is the teacher dashboard is customizable. So every place where you see a checkbox, teachers can either choose to display or not display that information on their individual dashboard. In the <coughs> section with student names, you can see the kind of data that is provided. And many of those data points are actually buttons, so you can drill down. So if you see that a child had an MCAS score of 240, 
can click on that, go to the MCAS and find out, so how did he or she get the 240? What skills did they, were they able to demonstrate and what skills were they weak on? The absentee histogram is also drill downable. So if you are a teacher who says, I want to call every parent when my child, when students in the class get to five absences, you could click on the, um, <coughs> click on the bar that uh, represents that and then it would give you student names for all the kids who are in that bar. Uh, so that's what the teacher dashboard looks like. Another view without having selected, you know, the buttons, just seeing what it looks like. So this is what it looks like, not in the, the setup mode, but what an actual mm -hmm. teacher's um, display would look like. So you have absences, you have tardies. There are other things that we're working on bringing in based on teacher requests, like to bring some more information about grades uh, for quarter one, quarter two, quarter three and four. You can see we have that in numerical, but um, some people have said they'd also like to see graphs on that. So we continue to build that out. But it's at a good state now, and it's uh, in a, a place where I think it's very usable for teachers. So this year, we've been in the process of training teachers to use the dashboard that was created for them. This sits as a button within the Aspen website, which is what teachers at middle and high school use to enter grades and use to enter absences. So for because they're familiar with Aspen, I think the learning curve has been a little bit quicker in middle and high school. Um, elementary teachers are not regular Aspen users, so um, we're working through the process of getting them comfortable with the dashboard. And there's another, you know, the fish go from year to year. Really, the third year sort of activity around this will be training and discussion about, so how can you use this information to adjust your instruction? So year two, um, I made the year one fish smaller so you could see the year two fish better. Um, that's the year we're in right now. Readers of the District Improvement Insider know that most significant piece of action research we have engaged in this year is the Labor Management Collaboration and Climate Survey. That's part of one of these fish that talks about effective decision making. Um, we talked a lot in the DIP team about what needs to change for the district to be able to um, make more effective progress and decision making was part of that. And I will say that um, I think many people who were part of that discussion with the DIP team thought the effective decision making didn't apply to them, but applied to all the people around them who were making bad decisions. And so um, I strongly advocated to flip that and say, no, we can't be victims of other people's decisions. If we're going to move forward, we all need to become better decision makers. And the two pieces in our practice of that really support that are the idea of reflective practice and the idea of action research. Um, so we did the, the survey um, really to model that for the district. Um, we had more than 50% participation by teachers and administrators. And um, we learned a lot about how Northampton teachers experience the work environment. One of the things we learned was that teachers experience typical levels of autonomy, goal alignment, psychological safety, uh, but they experience below average levels of peer collaboration and shared decision making. Um, so what does that mean? Um, it's been a big part of my ongoing communication with the researchers and their recommendation is that means that's what you should be talking about. How can you become better collaborators? How can you become better shared decision makers? And I think it's interesting that those two come up because those two are things that really will be a focus of a lot of the inclusion work we do next year because you have teachers sharing responsibility for kids. Very important for them to improve their collaboration skills. Um, so the other piece of that is reflective practice. Again, readers will know that we've been working through this book um, called, not everybody, but a, a, a book study group that I'm leading has been working through reflective practice to improve schools. And um, connected to that, we've been doing some work with the Center for Courage and Renewal called Leading Together. Um, that work really has 
taken root more so at the high school and the middle school than our other schools so far, but we will be expanding next year. And instead of just talking about what leading together is, I wanted to give you an experience of it. So the idea of leading together is really all around reflective practice. So let me guide you in a reflection that will take about a minute. It's the type of thing that we're doing through this. So if you're, what you really need to do for this is for school committee members, I would say, think about another school committee member that you want to reflect on for a minute. If you're really bold, you can close your eyes, although you don't have to. People watching at home can do this. People in the audience can do it as well. Um, OK, so if you have your person, here's what I want you to think about. This person has a body and a mind, just like me. This person has feelings, emotions, and thoughts, just like me. This person, at some point, has been sad, disappointed, angry, hurt, or confused, just like me. This person has experienced physical and emotional pain and suffering in life, just like me. This person wishes to be free from pain and suffering, just like me. This person wishes to be safe, healthy, and loved, just like me. This person wishes to be happy, just like me. Now let's allow some wishes to arise. I wish for this person to have the strength, resources, and support to help them through the difficulties in life. I wish for this person to be free from pain and suffering. I wish for this person to be strong and balanced. I wish for this person to be happy because this person is a fellow human being, just like me. So that is a protocol. That's probably the shortest one. We have ones that go a lot longer than that. But I know a lot of you are teachers. Imagine how it might elevate the discourse in a faculty meeting if whoever's leading the faculty began with that short reflection. You know, it, I think it's um, connected to the work of unified mindset, but it's also connected to helping us to reflect more on how we can bring our best selves to work, because I think that students will be the ultimate beneficiaries. So moving on, fish have stopped swimming, but the QSort process was another one of the initiatives for this year. Um, we've had many meetings about that, so I won't go into detail on that. Um, and this year also um, marked the, fi the finale of our differentiated instruction training piece. And the focus this year was on differentiating up. And the concept that we tried to use with differentiating up was productive discomfort. The idea that if you're always feeling comfortable in the classroom, that's not a good thing. You should be stretched a little bit. And one of the things that I think was most personally gratifying to me is in um, observations of classes, seeing one teacher who had actually made that sort of a, a big visual display, and she says, I keep pointing that out to my kids. You now, every time they start complaining, I just tell them, you should have some productive discomfort. You know, so you can take that concept too far, but um, that's the, the third thing we've been working on this year. So I just wanted to point out something that uh, is obvious to me but may not be obvious to all, which is um, the District Improvement Insider was really created as the way to provide accountability and updates on how the District Improvement Plan is going. You know that there are usually three sections We've been reading from the beginning. So here are three sections from next year based on the work plan and the, the um, things we really need to get done. So we have, you'll see next year anti-bias education will probably be front and center of each of our editions. Um, boy, I can't even see what that says. Home visit program, Home visit program um, which is something that we have to get back to um, negotiating some language around, but has been something that the DIP, DCP team has been discussing. And then um, professional learning communities really sort of become a much stronger focus in the professional development plan because we're sort of breaking off into different areas and specializing more at, at different schools. 
And so um, you'll be hearing about the professional learning communities. We have 10 already that we sort of have in some stage of development. And so uh, I think that part of the, the insider will be really easy to write because I think I'm just going to ask the um, leader of each of the PLCs to provide a report for one of the months. Um, so that's kind of where we're going. And that is the update on the district improvement plan. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. So do we have any questions about the district improvement plan? Mr. Meyer. So I guess what I'm most curious about with initiatives like this is how deeply do they penetrate into the organization, into the community? Um, you know, you gave some, some <clears throat> evidence talking about, you know, the garden program and how at least unified mindset had penetrated extent that that became part of their practice. Um, I wonder, are we tracking the data dashboard to see how often are teachers using it? I mean, to me, as a teacher, it seems like a great resource because, again, as you mentioned, a lot of times those, um, those data sets require you to go to a bunch of different web pages. Um, are we tracking it to see how it's being used? You mentioned that we've gotten some input from teachers as to adding things um, and sort of how, how are we, how are we you know, are we even, you know, do we have readership numbers for the district improvement plan at CIDR so that we can get a sense of, of whether it's reaching the people in a, in a meaningful way? I can't give you the, the answer for usage of the data dashboard. We don't have the capacity to see how many times teachers are clicking into it. Um, we do have the overall information that middle and high school are, have sort of taken to it sooner because of their familiarity mm -hmm. with Aspen. And as, as far as depth, it goes to my comment earlier. I think teachers see the data, but we haven't had the process of discussing, okay, so what do you do with it? You know, so I think that's the level of depth we need to get to next. In terms of uh, readers of the district improvement insider, we do have that because that goes out tracked. Um, and we have several hundred readers a month. Um, and we have readers that I believe are both within and without the organization because it's also tracked geographically. Um, and so we're read pretty much from Concord, New Hampshire, down to Trenton, New Jersey. Um, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Ms. Busansky. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought it was really useful. Appreciate it. Um, I guess I was curious about, and I'm not sure if I'm understanding the fish chart well enough or not, but just the differentiated instruction. So it looks like year three, there's another piece to it. Differentiation infuses instruction at all levels. So I guess I'm curious, similar to maybe what Mr. Meyer was asking, like how much, how do you think the differentiating up work has gone? How well infused? You sort of said it was the finale. So this is the part that Nancy hates when I say, because she would say that She's differentiation <laughs> work is never done. When we say it's infused, it is, but it's a practice that people need to keep working on. What it means is we will continue to provide support for differentiated instruction, but it's not going to be the main focus of our training efforts. We're hiring new staff all the time who come with varying levels of skill and differentiation, some of whom will have to be trained up and some of whom you know, may already have the skills. But um, we expect that to be at a, a fairly good level at this point. It's an effort that's been ongoing for at least three years um, that I've been here. I think it was ongoing prior to that. Um, you know, I'm not going to say there's no variance. There certainly is variance in terms of the different levels of skill have with the different levels of skill that different faculty members have providing differentiation. Um, but at this point, what we're saying is the expectation is that we've given a full course of training and we can continue to support you if you're struggling, but as a district, we're not going to continue to keep this as our main training focus. We're going to move on to other things. Things like 
implementing Math Investigations 3, doing the anti-bias training, doing the uh, inclusion work. Those sorts of things are now going to come to the front while we expect DI to be happening ongoing. Does that answer the question? Uh, it definitely answers the question, but it just leaves me with some concerns. I understand we have many priorities <coughs> and I understand why other things have to kind of come to the forefront, but I do, it does leave me concerned that we haven't quite finished the task at hand, which I think as we moved to this kind of differentiating model, especially in the middle school and freshman year of high school, that we're really then what I, I don't know, what I feel like I'm hearing is we haven't quite like finished the job of sort of really making sure that it's been infused and, and that leaves me concerned for advanced learners, it leaves me concerned for more general level and it leaves me concerned for struggling learners. So thank you, so let me just clarify. What I'm saying is that it's a process of personal development that goes on over a whole career. You know, it's one of the skills that you can always get better at like many skills in teaching. Um, but we believe that with more than three years of training in this, we've given teachers the foundations and certainly have repeated the expectation many, many, many times that differentiation will take place. So now it'll be addressed through observation and evaluation and providing additional support to people who demonstrate the need for it. And do you think there'd ever become a time where we say, okay, this differentiating isn't working? Like, how are we evaluating what's working and what's not in the classrooms for our students? Or well, we, this is working, is working well. Right. So we have multiple measures of student achievement. I mean, that, that's really where you want to see this, the, the evidence of the effectiveness. MCAS is one point. Um, we have our own district measures, which are another point. And what we're looking at, what we'd be looking for is evidence of effectiveness is that learners from all parts of the spectrum are making progress. We have district determined measures and we have teachers measuring the growth that students show from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, whether they're high achieving learners, average learners or below average learners. And we're looking at whether or not all three of those groups show progress. So. Um, that is a that is an ongoing part of assessment and I don't think it's a decision where we would make district-wide I think what we would say is there may be some places where we see people struggling with certain groups of students and those are the ones that we want to help um, we certainly have lots of evidence based on what we see in terms of growth of students that many teachers are reaching many kids um, can't say that it's 100%, but we work towards that. Other questions? Um, yes. Um, just in terms of differentiation, adding on to what Ms. Bizanski was saying, um, I would kind of disagree from, from a student perspective that particularly in terms of differentiating up for more advanced learners, it's hard to see that um, in data and test scores, um, especially if you have a kid in a class who's you know, at an advanced level that they're going to do fairly well on the test in that class or MCAS regardless and it's more of like an anecdotal experience within the class um, and whether they're being challenged and giving extra work or um, new stimulating tasks to work on with other students so I'm wondering if in these past few years and working on the differentiating up if there are ever any community forums or student forums because um, I really in my experience I've heard that the most opinions and really true experience on that comes from the students within the class, um, not so much in terms of data. So I guess I'll say two things to that. One is this is why you need to look at growth as well as achievement. You know, you can have students who come into a class with already having a high level of achievement, but there are ways of measuring whether or not they're just sort of plateauing along through the whole year and maintaining that or whether they're showing growth. So that's why we look at growth as well as achievement. The second piece is also related to educator evaluation. We have student feedback. So every teacher in the district is asking the students for feedback on a number of things. And one of the most commonly asked questions is about the level of challenge. So um, we do gather that on an individual teacher by teacher basis from the kids who've experienced the instruction. Um. How, how is that survey being done? Like, is it 
Are, do teachers individually give the surveys? Is there like a district survey? So teachers are empowered to develop their own survey with their evaluator. We do have model surveys that we've provided teachers as sort of, these are good ones we think are pretty good. You can give this or you can create your own. The, um, the procedure for uh, administering the surveys has been based on trying to balance the need to get every teacher some feedback with not overloading students with doing tons of surveys. So at middle and high school, I think it's typically been given in a particular period of the day. And they tell teachers, whatever class you have, that's who you're going to survey during that period. Um, that is not perfect because there are a lot of students who may have a number of specialists, so they may be filling out surveys for their teachers, their special ed teacher, their speech therapist, whatever. Um, but we want to have somewhat of a, a limitation on how much we're asking for students. But I think that's that's where you're going to get that data. We have had public forums. One of the things that was said in, in the forums is it's really hard to go to your teacher and say, I don't think you're challenging me. It's a lot easier, I think, to be able to provide that data in the form of an anonymous survey to your teacher. I mean, I, I would just say that um, I think on another level, it might not be a teacher by teacher basis. Um, it might be more of like a you know, course scheduling thing or a structural thing. So I would just, you know, encourage some more student forums or even including parents in forums with this because I agree that I, I don't think the conversation on differentiation is very close to being completed, although I really appreciate your work on it. I, I want to echo what you're both saying. Um, I've walked through a lot of other schools that have really implemented differentiated instruction in a thorough way and they've done it quickly um, and I mean it's a tricky term to define I mean it's possible to uh, well but I so it's, there are lots of different ways to differentiate but I, I do think that that anecdotally from what I've heard from students walking into classrooms in five of our six buildings you can recognize true differentiation going on if the classroom is almost entirely whole group instruction. If um, then it's probably not differentiated. Um, so I think we, I, I agree that if the school committee was setting the district improvement plan, which legally we're really supposed to be doing, I would put differentiation at the tippity top of the list because it has tremendous impact not only on student achievement but on uh, satisfaction in schools when you're uh, truly differentiating and you're, not, you're getting away from whole group instruction and you've got small groups in classrooms, then you've got the struggling kids doing work that's at their level so they're happier. Um, you've got the kids who are high flyers also engaged so they're happier. So I've been walked through schools where teachers say, once we went to small group differentiation, my discipline problems in the classrooms <coughs> almost evaporated. Uh, I, I think we're a long way from that in Northampton, and uh, anyone who thinks that we're good to go in Northampton should take a stroll through Franklin Avenue School in Westfield, which went from level three to level one in one year. So that's. Any other? Uh, oh, sorry, Rebecca. Sorry, I had just never heard about the survey. I'm just curious. Like, Ms. Fragamini, have you taken a survey in your years at, um, at UNOVA? That, that, that kind of caught me off guard because I, I mean, I've taken a lot of classes with a lot of teachers and maybe at one point I did. Um, I know this year in one of my classes, I think um, with Ms. Todd Hunter, we did a tripod survey mm -hmm. and that was incredibly helpful. And um, I was in her class just a few days ago and had a wonderful conversation with her um, about challenge um, and and expectations in her class just based on her reading those results and but from what I've heard that was only a very few very few teachers um, at the high school and I don't really recall other teachers having those types of conversations or surveys with us um, so I would encourage maybe the expansion of those tripod surveys um, because I do know I've personally had um, really great conversations with my teachers based off of doing that survey 
Yes. That's, that's the idea. Um, Tripod is one of the surveys that we give teachers the option of using for their educator feedback. This past year, we didn't have a lot of teachers who decided to use that. They used the either, I think most teachers used the one that was recommended by the educator evaluation team, which you heard about earlier tonight, or one of their own design. Um, but that is something that we continue to offer for all of our staff. And it's based on six C's or seven C's. One of those C's is challenge. And what's nice about that is teachers get feedback not only on how their, teach, their students experience challenge within the class, but also a comparison to how teach students of other teachers experience challenge. So they know kind of if they're in the right zone or if it, they're maybe not challenging enough or going too far. Yeah, and that, and that survey for the committee members who haven't taken it, it went through everything from like social and emotional feelings in the class to challenge and academic work um, to relation to how the teacher's expectations matched up with your um, own requirements and observations in the class. It was incredibly extensive and helpful, and I think even for myself reflecting on my experience in that year-long AP course. Um, but I really wish more teachers were doing it, um, and the fact that I don't have more teachers that are doing it concerns me um, and doesn't... You know, I think it's a good way to have that feedback and to have those conversations. So I would, I mean, I, I don't think you can like mandate teachers to have them all do this survey, but maybe strongly encouraging it would be helpful. Yeah. It's Burnham and then back to it's a quick thing that um, uh, Ms. Ms. Skansky had said that she hadn't known that they were doing them, and I can't speak to the high school, but I know that the elementary schools and the middle school have implemented it. So. Mr. Reed. I just want to add that the schools that truly are helping their teachers get to small group differentiated instruction cannot do it without a, a coach in every building. And you talk to principal coaches and, and uh, people who do this around the state, and until you give the teachers the support, they just don't have the time to make this big a shift. It's too hard, there's too much curriculum to develop, and you can't just send them to trainings for two years and then expect them to go back to their classrooms and magically differentiate. It's so much work. They've got to have an extra person in every building helping them make this happen. It's, 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 if you talk to people who do this, they, they would say, it won't happen without support in the building. I wonder. Me? No, you can go. And then you, you go first, Bonnie. Go for it. <laughs> so I just wonder. Um, I, I apologize. I haven't looked at the district improvement plan. I enjoyed the, the presentation, and I know you're a data guy, John. So I wonder, like, is there a point that you would, um, instead of looking at the time, let's take differentiated instruction as an example, where Three years does sound like a reasonable amount of time, but if there's no evidence or, or if you haven't, I guess what I'm questioning is, have you set goals for these things that you feel like it's time to move on? And are those goals based on accomplishments from, from walkthroughs or district data or what have you, or is it based on time? I guess I don't, I'm not grasping the whole sort of notion. I get, I get the concept of there's so much and there's, you need to move on at some point, but I wonder if, the, if because we're, sp we're speaking about differential instruction, for example, do you feel like there was a target that was met and now it's time to move on or is it more based on the time frame? I say, would say that practice definitely has improved in that area, yeah. without, without a doubt. Um, and what we are doing with inclusion is like an even more extreme version of differentiation and trying to provide more support through um, additional teachers in the classroom. Part of the sort of just very practical um, reason for moving on in addition to the fact that there are other pieces of practice that we need to help teachers with is there's saturation in the sense that if we were to, re to continue with DI trainings I think we would be repeating the same trainings we've already done so sure. I think yeah. there, there's a, min a sort of diminishing return from that kind of training yeah and I'm not sure training is the only way I mean I think people have thrown out other sort of things mm -hmm. but my real question is in terms of moving on, is there? Do you set some objectives or some goals to help you determine whether it's time to move on? How, how do you make that decision? That decision was made at the time that we developed the district improvement plan, yeah. and we said we have five years. We have all these initiatives. We need to fit them in a certain way. Yeah. At the time, um, we it was a very spirited discussion about how to sequence them and yeah, sure. when to phase things in and when to phase things out. So, at 
at the time that we were having the discussion, this was now th almost three years ago, yeah. there were concerns about other things such as anti-bias training and, and others that we sort of put on the back burner while we finished the differentiated instruction work. I say finished in the sense of making it a, a priority. Um, so I guess, you know, part of it is getting through the work that we had set out to do um, and getting to the other work that we identified for ourselves that we haven't done yet. I guess I just, uh, I mean, it seems reasonable to me to extend some things that need to go beyond three years if the, if the evidence isn't, if there's not enough confidence that we've made enough progress and some things might, may, be, may be met before three years. Is there, is there flexibility there? If, if differentiated instruction is a, such a strong foundational aspect of good teaching, good learning, heterogeneous grouping, meeting the needs of all kids, we would all agree to that. Yeah. That I wonder, um, you know, in a case like that, whether it could, it can be continued, and whether there is a measure or a a system in place where we know that this stuff is happening through walkthroughs, through evidence. I mean, we can come up with any sort of indicators yep. to make that decision more, uh, maybe in a way that's a little bit more scientific. Yep. Differentiated instruction is embedded in a number of the indicators that principals look for in their educator evaluation system. So that piece is ongoing and will always be ongoing until we have another educator evaluation system. Support for teachers who are demonstrating need for continuing support in that area will also be ongoing. Um, as part of this. Remember the fish, you know, they don't go away from year to year, they continue on. All we're saying is the emphasis is not on continuing to build skills and differentiate instruction. We will do that as needed, but now we're thinking we need to build skills and anti-bias and, and other things that we haven't been addressing to this time. Just on that, I, I do want to commend you for including anti-bias work in this district improvement plan. It's been something like I think from my first meeting on this committee that I, I've really hoped that this district would push for um, and included you in that. And um, I really appreciate and think it's important that we include that. Um, so thank you. Other questions about the presentation? Okay. Okay. So that uh, thank you for that progress report. Um, next item on the agenda, we have a second reading and a vote on <coughs> IJOA uh, field trips policy as revised. Ms. Fallon, do you have any uh, additional words on this? Um, I do not have any additional words. Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> uh, move to approve uh, policy IJOA as amended. Second. Okay, there's been a motion made and seconded. Again, we took this up on first reading and this is the second reading um, all those in favor of approving the revised oh, mr. Moore <laughs> sorry I, uh, um, I would uh, I, I, I think it's great policy but I think the thing from my concern about uh, field trips is that I think they're really a good thing and sometimes when you have a big policy like this and there's a lot of things to boxes to check in order to have a field trip be approved and I don't I think we should pay, and I don't know how we do it, find out and make sure, pay attention to field trips that might not be happening because of this policy. It would be field trips which we would support, but the only reason we're never finding out about them is because somebody just said, I just too much, too much, whatever, bureaucracy for this purpose. And if that's the case, then to revisit the policy, to, to figure out how we can make sure that we aren't discouraging good field trips because we have a policy. How did this policy change increase the paperwork or the bureaucracy? I don't think it increased it. I think I think what I'm saying is, I think this, whenever we look at these policies where you have to meet a number of criteria before you can have a field trip approved, um, so, you know, sometimes it just just the inertia of paperwork and, you know, it's like you have this idea and it's enough work to start the thing without doing the bureaucracy. So I'm just saying, pay attention to that as we go forward. It's not a critique of this policy per se. It's just that it is, a, you know, it has a bunch of boxes you got to check. And, and like I said, it's hard to measure policy, you know, proposals that never show up. But to keep an eye out for that as we go, you ask the, all the administrators to keep an eye out for that. You know, if they hear people saying, you know, I was thinking about doing this, but, you know, it just seemed like too much trouble. Um, and then maybe revisit it. Okay. So, there's been a motion made and second. Oh, I'm sorry, Elena. 
Yeah, um, so Superintendent Provost, I know at the meeting, the first meeting that I went to on this, there was some discussion about having the money from the students from abroad come and have that be part of a account that would provide um, assistance for students in this. Is that like being set up by you or is it being set up by this committee? Find something. <laughs> so that would require a real multi-step process. Um, not saying it's impossible. First of all, we need some international students to do it. Uh, <laughs> but second of all, um, the tuition we receive needs to go to the cost of their instruction. Now, cost of their instruction includes the salaries of the teachers, includes heating the building, includes some other things. So you might be able to take some money from those accounts and, and create scholarship. As I said, I think at that meeting I did survey other superintendents on this issue. The sort of one um, response we had around a sort of real viable mechanism for creating some kind of sustainable or reliable f funds for financial support for international travel did come from a school with an F1 program that used a certain portion of their tuitions to offset costs for students. Um, but since we don't have any students right now, we haven't gone through the process of trying to figure out how that might happen. I just remember from that meeting that that seemed like the one prospect that we had to yes. provide financial assistance. So it's a bit disappointing. And I understand we can't like force international students to come and bring us money, but it is, um, oh. dis it is disappointing that we won't have that source. Well, I just want to say it may be a little bit early to get discouraged because the State Department just finished determining that Northampton High School is, in fact, a <coughs> high school. So we just got on the list. Okay, so um, students haven't been able to apply for very long. I will save my disappointment, but I, but I do hope that we can figure out some way to set that up. And I, I want to just second what Elena said, that I really applaud you, Dr. Provost, for wanting to solve the problem and coming up with a solution that may not be funded yet, but at least it was a, a can-do, let's fix the problem approach, which I appreciate. You're welcome. Okay. So, uh, motion's been made and seconded to approve the field trip policy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the field trip policy revision is approved. Next, we have a requested vote to revise the retirement date of a uh, staff member, Lee San Giordano, and Dr. Provost, I'll let you um, describe that. This is a modest modification just for everyone's um, awareness. Once a <coughs> retirement is accepted by the superintendent, it can only be undone by a vote of the school committee. Reason for that is sometimes we make budgetary decisions based on anticipated retirements and or known retirements, and um, we may at some point be in the position of me not recommending that the committee allow someone to change their date. However, this is a change um, just from December 30th, 2017 to February 28th, 2018. We haven't hired a replacement. We haven't offered anyone a position. So this is a change we can make without any impact to the budget. And it's a change that the employee is requesting in the best interest of students. She would like to stay on till the end of first semester so that she can see her kids through that first cycle, work on her, um, her letters of recommendation and so forth. And um, then pass it on to the, her replacement for the beginning of the second semester. So I would approve that. So I make a motion um, for the revision of the retirement date of Lee Singh. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion about that? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that retirement date revision is approved. Next, we have a uh, vote to accept a gift. This is from the family of Denise Wood, and it's for a memorial statue for Leeds Elementary School. Yes, the family of Denise Wood, who was a teacher at Leeds School for approximately 20 years, uh, would like to make a donation that has a value of about $1,100. It actually would be a stone plaque placed in the ground with her name, and it says Mother, Teacher, Friend. And then it has another... Um, was described as a standing plaque coming up out of it that talks about pinwheels for peace. 
So something they would plant at the school um, next to a newly planted tree to have that as a memorial of her service at Leeds School. Make a motion to, uh, to accept the gift from the family of Denise Wood for memorial statue for Leeds. Second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that gift is accepted. <coughs> Another gift, uh, this is the Leeds PTO, and it is for a gaga ball pit <laughs> for the Leeds playground. Yes, and if you're all eagerly wondering what that is, um, it was in one of the pieces I read that uh, Sal Canada had provided to us, it called it a giant, kinder, gentler method of dodgeball, which I think we're probably all familiar with from our growing up days. So it's actually an octagonal shaped container where the kids get in it and they're playing with a softball and it's a case of hitting below the knees. So it's kind of a, a kinder method of dodgeball. The PTO <laughs> will be building this for us. The materials they'll be buying have a value of about $1,800. Um, this will get put on the playground at Leeds School. And according to Principal Kanata, the kids are eagerly looking forward to it because it is something they already use right now at Nature's Classrooms and they use it at the YMCA um, Camp Norwich for the kids that go there. So the, a lot of the kids are actually familiar with it already. Make a motion to accept the Leeds PTO gift for a Gaga ball pit for the Leeds playground. Second. Okay. Am I pro are we pronouncing that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I believe so. Lady, Lady Gaga Lady. ball pit. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So, uh, Thank you very much. That's approved. The next item is an, a vote to increase the FY17 circuit breaker budget by $156,425 for extraordinary relief. Yes, this is just to formalize the process on the budget side of it. We notified you at the last meeting that about 24 hours before the meeting, we had been notified by the Department of Ed that we had received extraordinary relief. This is the good and bad news. We received the grant, which will greatly help out our budget. The bad news is we got the grant because our special ed expenses this year had increased so much. So this is just formally recognizing a, an increase to the budget, putting the money into private school tuitions. Um, and then we will spend the monies by June 30th. Motion to agree to increase the FY17 circuit breaker budget by $156,425 for extraordinary relief. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that motion carries. Next, there is a vote to adopt the municipal modernization procedure <coughs> for signing warrants. Yes, one of the things I found frustrating when I came was that we were only able to pay bills once a month. Um, and the reason for that is it's tied to school committee meetings. We need a majority of the signatures. It's really hard at any time other than a school <coughs> committee meeting to get a majority of you in. So I usually bring the stack of warrants to you at the meeting. Um, they make the rounds and get the signatures. But paying vendors once a month has a hidden cost to us because vendors are aware of it. They know that it, they're going to have to float that money for a while and it plays into pricing with some contractors. It also makes it really hard when we're reimbursing a staff member or have a small bill for a, a small local business and we have to say to them, you missed the warrant by a day or two. It's going to be another month before you get paid. I hadn't been able to fix it until recently, but one of the things that the Municipal Modernization Act passed within the last year did is give communities more leeway on how to do a number of things to improve our efficiency and cost effectiveness. And one of them was to give us a mechanism to be able to pay our bills quicker. And that would be by having the school committee vote to allow one member of the school committee to be their designee for signing warrants. There would have to still be a report back to the meeting. Um, to a following school committee meeting on what was done and other schools that I've talked to are doing this by including a copy of the signed warrant in the next agenda packet. Um, so I'm asking tonight, it's actually a two part, two votes here if you proceed with this, is number one to ask you to approve adapting this portion of the Municipal Modernization Act and allowing one person and a delegate um, to be designated to sign bill warrants and if that successfully goes through the next vote would be ask you to name the person and the alternate so that we can start this in the near future. It would actually be very handy to have for the close of the fiscal year. Just to clarify, this wasn't just a, this law wasn't just specific to 
um, school committees. Yeah, I believe it was also right. for a multiple member select boards. Yes. Some conservation commissions have warrants, and so it was basically across the board that if you had a multi-member body, you could designate one member. Yeah. Yeah, we've I've quoted the law in the cover <coughs> memo that everybody got. Um, motion to adopt the municipal modernization procedure for signing warrants as described by our business administrator. Second. Any discussion on that? Quick question. Sure. So does it have to be one person? One person has to be designated or could it be rotational? The law, the law reads to have a voted delegate. I haven't heard anything about a rotation. Okay. Because it's actually giving somebody the authorization to represent the school committee in signing the bill. Which we're now authorized now. I mean, we're we have to have five out of the nine members at each meeting. I'm sure that a rotating basis would work. So, I mean, be before we vote, I mean, should we see if anybody's going to volunteer to do That's this? That's the next. So, can I just make clear that even if you're, you agree to be the de delegate, we all still share the responsibility for the mm -hmm. warrants according to the law. So, it's not by yeah. saying, okay, I'll sign it, that you're the so person solely responsible if anything's untoward in the accounting. So, uh, that was pretty clear, right? In the. Yeah. Until it's challenged. Okay. So, um, well, so the question is, do we want to, um, uh, someone's raised the question, before we adopt this, are we sure that there, someone will actually want to accept this designation? Is that that's the question you had? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I so so sure. Can I ask a question. Sure, may. So it would entail coming down to my vision of it is that there would be a set schedule. So right now, my office knows that the warrant has to be ready for the school committee meeting. I would envision having a, setting up a schedule probably every two weeks. Um, I don't know, possibly you know Thursday afternoon after one o'clock. Um, and that would be worked out with whoever the person is so that my office would know when to have the bills ready mm -hmm. and we, we're still working around some timelines with the city so it's probably not going to be a Monday for example because of when we have to get stuff into the city um, and would it be something that maybe there could be a window so it's like Thursday or Friday morning or something or does it have to be like the exact same time no I think I, I definitely was thinking of like you know Thursday after one o'clock which would be one to four thirty but it may be something where it could be Thursday afternoon or Friday morning yeah. and what happens if that designate can't um, make it that's why the proposal is to have an alternate Don't we have someone on the school committee that's always right there and always signing warrants anyway? <laughs> yeah. I sign I sign the city warrant every two weeks, which includes you know. <laughs> so there's different. Yeah, there's payroll warrants. There's bill. I sign a lot of things. That's what I do. I mean, what are a few more things? Really? Well, a chance to go get a Harold's ice cream. Oh, <laughs> so that's certainly a possibility. Others have raised possible concerns about that so that's I could certainly serve um, in one of those roles whether the primary or the alternate whatever the school committee felt comfortable with you know that's because I am usually there yeah. um, so it's I, I'd be to end this discussion I'd be happy to be the signer so if you want to blessings on you Danny okay. that's in and as long as you're willing to step forward as as necessary as necessary <laughs> okay sure so um so it sounds like we've got interest so <laughs> they're vol <laughs> voluntary or involuntary. passionate um, so the so the motion on the table right now is to first just accept this provision of the mass municipal modernization act um so do we want to move forward there's been a motion made and seconded to take that vote all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So then the next item on the agenda is to designate committee members to be the uh, person responsible for signing the warrants. Um, I'd, so we can, if someone would like to make a motion uh, based on. Uh, can we ask a question before we make a motion? Sure can. <laughs> I, I appreciate doubting volunteering, but I'm wondering, is there a logical is there is there some sort of a logic to having someone on budget and property 
serve as the warrant signer? I mean, do those two tasks overlap in a way that that would be? So, are we we're, so we're designating a person repeatedly? That person's going to change every election, or is there a way to designate a post? Like the chair of budget and property is always the warrant signer. Is I guess where I'm going with this. Nobody else spoke up. <laughs> I don't know about all. I mean, <laughs> I'm happy to give you it. There is no logic because nobody else said anything. Yeah, but that, right. was, that, that was just because I was waiting to see if you would speak. <laughs> <laughs> I Dr. sense Rose. that, Howard. I, <laughs> I would just like to point out that there could be a time when the holder of a post may find it impractical to be the signer. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Or conflict of interest. Oh, and that's right. that. Yeah. Yeah. You may have the chair of oh, right. budget property. You may have a conflict-based reason. Like they work they out of town and may not be able to come in during the day to do it. So, um, I mean, and I think that we'd be allowed the authority to change if, at a certain point, it became problematic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Seven minutes, and I'm already problematic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant was if Mr. Meyer came forward and said that he, you know, was having an issue getting here to do it, then he may want to select somebody else. <laughs> so we can change it. It's not like, I don't think okay. it says that it has to be for works. a two-year term or anything okay. like that. I think it's just it's, whoever we have designated now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You could take it away from so, me. <laughs> So we, if your handwriting city, I say we, the city council designates two people to sign all the orders, like to sign all the city council orders, so that we don't have to have it, that all the city councilors sign it when it's approved. So it's a similar thing, but that can rotate. And sometimes one of those people isn't there, and they take a vote and say, "We're replacing, you know, that person with that person." So it, it's it could be changed. So, um, so now we w I would entertain a motion to appoint a, uh, a primary and an alternate um, designee of the school committee uh, to have that uh, warrant signing power responsibility. All right. So, um, make a motion that we uh, appoint a primary and a alternate signer of warrants. And who, I think to wit, <laughs> drum roll, please. <laughs> to wit, Mr. Meyer as our primary signer, with the alternate being the mayor. Uh, I'll, sec I'll second that. <laughs> There's a motion made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. Uh, so now the next <laughs> item on the agenda is to refer the matter of the transportation supervisors off our duties to the negotiating subcommittee. Um, uh, Dr. Provost, if you'd like to just give a quick description of this. There are a, a number of um, financial decisions that need to be made between <coughs> the end of the year to close the books, to make sure all the bills are paid, to spend down our money. To, I'm sorry, am I on the wrong item? Sorry. <laughs> Which one are we on? <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Oh, uh, station supervisor I'm off. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry. <laughs> well, I'll replay that in a few minutes. Okay. Um, so there currently is uh, a situation which I think is quite unique with transportation of uh, transportation <laughs> supervisor, which is that on days when the person in that post is ill and we need to call a snow day, they make less money than they would if they were well. Because in order to qualify for the usual overtime that hourly employees get when I call them at 4.30 in the morning and say we need to make a decision, um, they need to be present that day. Um, so I'm not certain that that makes sense that, you know, to be called out of bed when you're sick, you make less than when you're called out of bed when you're well. Um, so it's a problem that I bring to the school committee's attention for a possible referral to the negotiating subcommittee um, to see if it's something that NACE would entertain trying to find a resolution for. Okay. And this was a request that came from a NACE member, so we're referring it to... Well, this is actually a request that comes from 
the administration okay. based on some of the issues that we see in it, including the sort of perverse incentive that it creates for people to come to work when they're deathly ill, which we certainly have experienced a few times this winter. Okay. So could I get a motion? Sure. To a motion to refer to matter of transportation supervisor off our duties to the negotiating subcommittee. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any objections? <coughs> Okay, so that matter is referred. Next, we have a vote on the uh, granting superintendent uh, budget transfer authority to close out the FY 2017 books. Oh, let the superintendent do it. He started it. <laughs> <laughs> so as you heard, there are a number of financial decisions that need to be made between now and the end of the fiscal year. We don't have another school committee meeting, so we can't bring you any more transfers. Um, we and certainly anticipate there will be transfers um, as we try to spend down accounts and pay the bills. And this is in one of the school committee policies that there will be a vote at the June meeting to grant the superintendent authority to make transfers unilaterally to close the books. Make a motion to grant the superintendent budget transfer authority to close the FY17 books. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that uh, authority is granted. Next, we have the business administrator's report as well as the person's report. Yep, you've got the monthly financial report there. Um, basically, uh, because of the transfers you approved at the last school committee meeting, you actually see a lot less deficits in the accounts than we've seen previously. Um, overall, the budget is looking in pretty good shape going into the last month of school, in large part due to that extraordinary relief payment that we got. And also, as I mentioned in the report, also due because we've had a record low year for unemployment expenditures. It's the lowest in at least the 10 years that have been charted. So um, that also is going to take some of the pressure off other parts of our budget. There's no questions on that. I'll move on to the gifts. Um, we had a few gifts this month. We have three gifts from PTOs that were accepted by the principals. They actually were all at JFK, and two of them relate to global STEM. There was a PTO gift of $500 to Molly McLaughlin for some global STEM program cost, and a uh, donation from the PTO to JFK of $500 for Kate Parent for some work with the global STEM program. And then there was a third gift from the JFK PTO for the babysitting CPR course that was offered, and that was a $400 gift. And then there were two gifts this month accepted by the superintendent that were the $1,000 or less that he's allowed to accept. One was on behalf of or for Leeds School. There were more memorial donations made from a number of people on behalf of Phyllis Ryan, the library ESP had passed away. So those donations right now total approximately $500 and they've been placed into a gift account to be expended on program costs of the building in her memory. And there was also a total gift of $550 accepted from all six of the school PTOs for the Special Olympics program that was held last week, I believe, at the high school. Um, all six of the PTOs each contributed a portion of money to that, a gift to that, so that T-shirts and other expenses for the Special Olympians could be covered. And the personnel report is actually very short this month. We've got a new hire of a custodian, retirement of an ESP, um, transfer of a secretary, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the passing away of Phyllis Ryan, one of our long-term ESPs. Thank you very much. Uh, that leads us to the superintendent report. I took one of yours, so I wonder if you want to do this one. This is a two-part report. Um, I actually put the first part on later today. Um, when I became aware, as we heard in public comment tonight, that there was some disappointment regarding the level of parental involvement in our limited role of elementary SRO at element, our elementary schools. I believe there may be some misunderstanding about what exactly was decided. Um, the building principals are authorized to use the resource officer in the way that makes most sense to their individual school communities, and that's the charge they've been given. This includes not using the SRO at all, if that's what makes sense for their schools. Um, 
At Leeds, Mr. Kanata discussed this with the school council. His plan was to have the SRO make his first visit during field day. That didn't happen because um, the individual was injured and is now on desk duty. At Ryan Road, it was decided that he would attend morning meetings of teachers who chose to invite him to their classrooms. At Bridge Street in Jackson, principals felt that it was better to wait until next year to begin school-based decision uh, school-based discussions on how to use a resource officer. One of the things that I learned from the reactions both to the initiation and the cessation of High Five Friday is that our community has a diversity of opinions concerning police contact with youth. I don't think a one-size-fits-all approach will work in Northampton. That's why the successor program was envisioned as a site-based, parent-involved process. Sorry that that wasn't clear to all. But um, the guiding principle in our revised plan was to have people who are closely related to the kids make the decision rather than to try to make it from the central office level or the committee level. So that was part one. Part two is sort of reflections on the school year and where I think, I think it's actually related to the DIP presentation, sort of where I think our current challenges are. So let me start by saying that a school year is short. You have to make every day count if you're going to reach your goals. There are only 185 teacher work days and 180 school instructional days. And not all of them are high quality days. Some of them are Fridays before vacations <coughs> or final exam days. Or snow delays when you have to cram everything in on a shortened schedule. But a school year is also long. It's a long time not to get discouraged. It's a long time not to give in to anger or bitterness, long time not to blame or judge other people, long time not to feed into gossip or rumors. Looking over the past year, I think we've used time effectively to pursue our goals. I described a lot of the work that's been done in my presentation tonight on the district improvement plan. And the fractal nature of schools is such that principals replicate the district improvement process at the school level through their school improvement plans and process. In a similar way, teachers have their individual goals that principals monitor. Um, and with very few exceptions, I do believe that we're meeting or demonstrating substantial progress towards our goals. So we know how to deal with the brevity of the year, but I think we struggle sometimes with the length of the year. We're a community of very fallible persons. We struggle to place the common good at ahead of our own enlightened self-interest. We struggle to make it all the way to the end of the year without acting upon what Pat Summit calls the certain tendencies that all of us are born with. Um, we want to support the integral human development of every constituency touching uh, that we touch, including students, families, and ourselves. But sometimes that vision is too broad for us. Sometimes we're daunted by the scope and we're also daunted by disagreements among constituents about which path is most supportive. That's why we plan to expand the Leading Together work that you had a chance to experience tonight. As I said, we started our Leading Together journey with the ALT team, JFK, and the high school. Next year, we'll continue with those original groups. I'll actually be speaking at Smith College tomorrow about um, our journey for other schools who are interested in taking on this work. And I believe this work will be especially helpful in the elementary schools as we move toward a more inclusive service delivery model because inclusion is really a philosophy of community and leading together is a process for building adult community. I do think it's possible to have strong classroom communities without a strong adult community, but it's much preferable to have them both um, because the synergies um, allow for powerful learning to occur on a more regular basis. Um, so I'll close with one of our leading together touchstones that I have found to be true, that I hope others will discover to be true in the year ahead, and that I would offer as my positive intention for the school committee. Know that it is possible to leave this circle with whatever it is you need, and that the seeds planted here can keep growing in the days ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have no new business items. Um, we do have few <coughs> business and meeting dates. Budget and property will be meeting on June 14th at 2.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. Rules and policy committee will be meeting June 22nd, 
8.30 p.m. in the superintendent's office. And our next regular school committee meeting is July 13th, uh, which is always the same night as the city council meeting in July, uh, at 7.15 p.m. Uh, in the JFK community room. Uh, we do have a request for an executive session, and I'll ask the uh, <coughs> vice chair to make the motion uh, uh, for that for that executive session. Can make we, a motion. Can I have a comment before we do that? Sure. So I just want to come full circle with the with the uh, police um, school resource officer. So now that it's been clarified, and thank you very much for that. And I think it's a great idea what you've done. But how do we ensure that the community knows that this is now the decision, and therefore parents or uh, community members who want to participate in the decision would know that to go to their school council or principal for that. I could ask the principals to put it in their newsletters. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll make a motion uh, request for an executive session in the JFK principal's conference room under Massachusetts general law. Open meeting chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining NACE whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect on the school committee's negotiating position. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, yes is to go into executive session. Yes. Ms. Laura Fallon. Yes. Ms. Ann Hennessy. Yes. Sure. Aye. Mr. Howard Moore. Yes. 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 Okay, so the committee has voted to move into executive session. Uh, that is because to discuss these issues in a open session would be detrimental to our committee's negotiating position. I also need to advise the public that we will be adjourning from within executive session. We will not be returning to open session. So we will now move into executive session.